Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It's April 24th, 2023, and we are live streaming tonight uh, for another amazing episode with the John Larson of Mormon Expression Podcast. For those of you who don't have the background, uh, back in around, I would say, 2009, 2010, uh, an important voice emerged within Mormon discourse. His name was John Larson, and he did a several years series of Mormon themed podcasts called Mormon Expression Podcast. And uh, while he he shocked the world when he went into retirement, because of your generous donations, we were able to bring him out of retirement, where he does a monthly episode on Mormon Stories Podcast. You can donate to the John Larson Mormon Expression Mormon Stories collaboration and pro um, project at mormonstories.org slash Mormon Expression, all one word. You can also check out the entire back catalog of John's Mormon Expression episodes, either on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts under the Mormon Expression moniker. But we are back with John Larson today. Uh, Want to thank those who are the super chats are already uh, coming in. LP Cat says John Larson's worth uh, this before the show even starts. John, you're you're bringing in donations before the podcast has even started. RB has already sent a super chat as well. Uh, welcome back to Mormon Stories Podcast, John Larson. Thanks, John. It's my uh, pleasure to be here. My my monthly uh, waiting in the swamp. Yes. <laughs> Wait, I, I, I object <laughs> to that characterization. Uh, now, nor we have never done, I don't think, a, a John Larson episode maybe really early on, but traditionally we have the amazing Kara Burrell or Nuance Ho joining us. Kara is traveling with family in Ohio. So we uh, we send her our love and we express our regret that Kara Burrell can't be with us today. Anything you wanna say about that, John? Yeah, a little of the magic is gone, but we'll just have to uh, white mail it up here <laughs> a little bit. All right. Well, we've got several people in the live stream already. We want to let you let you all know in the live stream that we will welcome your comments. We'll show them or we'll pose your comments or questions or post them as they as they show up. Um, and uh, we always welcome in and we always appreciate those super chat donations as well. So, John, do you have some pre pre uh, topics for discussion or announcements before we launch in? I will say one thing. Um, Second, our Heavenly Father has blessed us with uh, moisture along the Wasatch Front. You you, uh, you did a really important episode about the the tox the toxic nature of the Great Salt Lake. Um, I don't know last year sometime, and the New York Times took note and and uh, did some uh. reporting. As a result, the the thing that we're noticing is this massive historic snowpack which so far has increased the levels of precipitation or, or of water in the Great Salt Lake. I think we're ahead of schedule. And one thing I noticed is Sugar House Park here in Salt Lake is actually shut down to passing cars because there's so much runoff from uh, the, the snowpack melt that they're trying to control the, um, the I don't know, the irrigation flow Otherwise, Salt Lake City is going to be in peril with flooding. So, John Larson, your secular prayers have worked too well, I think. Well, it, it's good. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really happy that there is, is, is more water. This is a, uh, this is a, a, a tragedy on multiple levels um, with, with the lake and with other places. Um, however, um, you know, we're not, we're not out of the woods. Um, this, uh, you know, having high rain and temperature fluctuations like we have are all kind of predicted by many climate um, scientists um, with climate change. So, um, you know, in the in the, a couple of decades ago, they used to call it um, global warming. And that, of course, confused people because every time it snowed in the winter, they'd say, see, there's no such thing. So um, we still have a long way to go. But thank you um, to the yeah, the sky gods of Salt Lake City for sending the rain. Yeah. All right. Well, you've got some pre, you got at least one pre topic for discussion that you want to address. So what, what's the pre show? What we got for the yeah. pre show? Yeah. Uh, to, to kind of level set, um, we haven't um, said this for a while that, um, I 
am only interested in, in, in what is true. I'm not, I'm not part of any club. So I don't have a vested interest in a particular outcome of truth. Um, and, um, my journey, my voyage, um, through faith and through trying to understand things like Mormonism is really about trying to arrive at what's true, which is a really hard thing to do. Um, and part of that is I, I put out the challenge. If there's anything that I'm saying that's wrong, I would like to know that so that, so that I, I can fix it. Um, because, um, just cause I said it two minutes ago or 10 days ago, doesn't make me um, vested in it. I, I want to know the truth. And uh, as a reminder, you can all reach me if you want to. My email is john, J-O-H-N, at John Larson, J-O-H-N, L-A-R-S-E-N, dot org. And um, I read all the emails, and I eventually respond to them. Sometimes it takes me a month or so before I sit down and and um, and answer. But please, you can um, send me your feedback. Of course, you're always welcome to send feedback to Mormon Stories. John, where should they send feedback if they want to? Uh, with me, it's just mormonstories at gmail.com. Okay. Well, fantastic. Well, one of the, um, probably the biggest complaint, um, that I have registered over the years, the, 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 the biggest, um, issue the, the, the people have with me is, is about my rhetorical style. Um, uh, particularly my use of profanity, um, and my use of, of non even tempered emotion. Um, and, and every so often I address this issue and I think it's time for me to address it again. Um, this, my, my uh, podcast and my interaction with the ex-Mormon world, of which John has so graciously carved out a little space inside Mormon stories. So before I say what I'm going to say, this applies to me and not to all of Mormon stories. I think John has done a brilliant job over the years of giving voice to all sectors and all views on faith, from the most faithful to wingnut weirdo prophets to people like me. Um, um, John lets us all talk. And I think that's been the brilliance and, and beauty of, of, of your project, John. Um, so, so what I'm about to say really apply, applies to me. And, and my rhetoric on Mormon um, expression quickly evolved into basically the, the analogy I'm going to use, it's like a support group for people who have declared bankruptcy due to medical bills. bills. Uh, forgive the kind of belabored uh, uh, metaphor, but but you'll understand in a minute. So so we're sitting here talking, all of us, because we've suffered this this bankruptcy because we had medical bills, right? And we're mad at the medical billing system. We're mad at the state. We're mad at the fact that we have to pay so much money. We're frustrated by the fact that we're out of money. We're frustrated by the fact we had to, uh, um, bankruptcy. And we constantly get people who come sauntering into our little support group and say, well, I'm perfectly healthy. I don't know what's wrong with you guys. Or they say, hey, my insurance bed's great. I haven't had any financial problems. Or my favorite, I have gobs of fucking money. Why are you guys complaining? Because I'm okay. I get it. I get that there are people who are happy in the church and who it works for. I'm, I'm super I'm super pleased that, that, that you guys have not had any problems, but I'm not talking to you. I've never been talking to you. And you're here as a matter of courtesy. Um, I, I, of course, choose to do this on Mormon stories. I don't lock the doors, so I allow anybody um, um, to, to listen in on what we're saying. But this is a conversation between people who have been hurt by the church. The fact that you have not been hurt or your experience has been completely positive does not invalidate the pain, suffering, and anger of others. I am speaking as one who has experienced that trauma, and I'm speaking to others who have experienced that trauma. Our language, me and my, my friends that I'm talking to, is the language of anger, it's the language of hurt, and it's the language of of it's the a, a language of outrage. I'm 50 years old. I've spent the last 18 years out of the church. Last time I went to the church was 2005. I spent 32 fucking years in a cult. That is like a, a, a murder sentence. 32 years of my life. I was in an organization that practices um, a high degree of all sorts of unhealthy practices. And that made me mad when I discovered the truth 
that then the, and the truth being that the church wasn't what they said they were and they were actively lying to me and others to preserve their own status and their own whatever um and and you have a church that is full of fantasy and and um, manipulating liars who serve a status quo to protect their own finances, their own status, their own jobs, their own careers, and their own family. I get it. I get why you're doing it. But you have to understand that we're pissed off because doing so, protecting this church because it benefits other people who come in and listen and then cancel their donation to John DeLynn, um, that you need to respect the anger of the marginalized community, those who have suffered because they left the church. I am the voice of anger. I am the voice of trauma. And to do this, I channel the anger that I once felt. John mentioned at the beginning, I stopped doing Mormon um, expression. And one of the biggest reasons I stopped was to preserve my own mental health. It's not healthy to wallow and roll in anger all the time, but anger itself is a healthy emotion when it's expressed at the right time. And, and when you found that you have been fraudulently played, that you have had money that you didn't have to give taken away from you, when you find that there are people who are lying actively and covering up actively the sins of other people in order to preserve their own thing, it pisses you off. Um, so the good news is that the anger doesn't spill over for me. It's contained. I come here once a month and I get kind of pissed off and then I go and do other things. But this sucks. I, I mean, not being here with you, John. I mean, the, everything about the church and how false it is and how much pain it causes and the suicides and the, and the, and the, and the suffering and the billions of dollars hoarded and just everything about it. And you, my dear listeners, the ones that I'm talking to, you were done dirty. And that's me telling you that, that, that I am giving voice and expression to the anger of people who have been told, oh, you know what, if, if you're really a good person, then you just go away quietly. You don't make a fuss. You, 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 you let religious people do their religion because they're all good. And the fact that they might, they might be sticking it to you doesn't matter. It does matter. And that's why I talk this way. I'm not a dummy. I know how to code switch. I don't talk like this all the time. Actually, in my house, we, we do swear quite often. And, and actually, in 2023, I'm surprised at how many people complain about us swearing because when I watch regular TV, I, I hear the F word every, every six words. Nevertheless, that's why I talk the way I do, and that's why this is. This is a support group for people who felt angry. It's not for you kittens who've had a wonderful time in the church. I love it. I love that you're addressing it. And it, John, is it okay if we if we maybe talk a little bit more just while you're talking about it? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, you know, I every single episode that we Okay, so first of all, I'll just say this. If I when I started Mormon Stories, I mean, I started with the whole I mean, some of the some of the goals that I started Mormon Stories uh, for very much still persist. There was always an informed consent element to Mormon stories where I just felt like people needed to know the truth so that they could make informed decisions. That's never changed. Um, I also uh, I also wanted Mormon stories to be as respectful as possible so that a, a newly doubting or questioning member would feel safe you know, because even even Mike Norton had was doing a Mormon themed podcast before Mormon Stories. He called it the Church is Not True podcast, right? And he would swear and get angry, and that was fine. I I listened; it was entertaining to me and informative. But I said, okay, well, I I want to help people. I want to give people the help that I would have appreciated having when I went through my faith crisis. And I would have wanted something to not have swear words, to, to be even keeled, that kind of felt Mormon-ish, but that talked about things that, that I was uncomfortable talking about. And so, you know, that's what I, that's, you know, those things have carried through to now um, uh, in, in many ways. Now, of course, I've struggled with my own anger over the years. I've struggled, uh, you know, I've, I've sworn a time or two, 
Um, but generally speaking, I've, I've, and like you mentioned, John, so gracefully, I've tried to always have a variety of voices on Mormon stories. When I, every time I do an episode with you, John Larson, I, I usually get at least one to three to five people who basically say, you know, John DeLynn, I wish you wouldn't have John Larson on. He, you know, he, the swearing's unnecessary or his tone, the anger isn't good. And, um, you know, it, you're going to be scaring off the, you know, usually it's not for me, John, it's not like believing Mormon that says, I don't like potty words. Usually it's non-believing or ex Mormon that says what I valued about Mormon stories was that it was calm and collected and balanced and felt safe. And when you bring someone on who's angry or use uses bad words. Um, it makes me sad because I know that people are going to turn it off who otherwise would tune in, um, who are, who need the support, but are going to turn it off because they can't deal with swear words and, or with anger. Um, I, John, I'm just going to share with you my reasons for why I still do this. And then I want to hear your response. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Um, so, so I, I brought, I brought John Larson back on Mormon stories for a couple of reasons. The first and foremost is I love John Larson and I respect John Larson and I value his, his wisdom, his experience and what he has to say. Uh, and so when John came back and said, Hey man, I'd be willing to come out of retirement. I'm like, let's make this work. So that's the first reason it's born out of a respect for John. A second reason that I've kept John on is because he resonates with people. There is a large, I mean, it, there is a large group of people within my listenership that tune into Mormon stories or that donate to Mormon stories purely for John, because John reflects an important part of my community. And why shouldn't they have content that's directed specifically towards them? Why should we only on Mormon stories cater to a certain group of people, newly questioning people, newly doubting people, people fresh in the struggle. Why can't we also have some content that caters to just the people who are in it, that are struggling, that are sad, that feel broken, that feel disturbed, that frankly need reminders that they're not crazy, that they're not alone, and that reflects um, what they're feeling. And John, I do think it's an act of service for you to continue staying behind, so to speak, and re exposing yourself to issues and to emotions that I think you've probably largely processed. But I almost think if there's proxy work, you're sort of, you're sort of channeling proxy rage as a way for my, a, a chunk of my listenership and viewership to feel validated. And in that sense, I think it's an act of charity. Um, and, and I think a chunk of my viewers and listeners, a significant chunk really value it. So that's the second reason. A third reason, John, you've already said it. If you've watched the movie inside out, you'll know that the, the person that the movie was about was not well because they were trying to push down an emotion in the case of inside out, they were trying to push down their sadness. Well, pushing down emotions just leads to more problems. So John, I love it that just like with inside out, ch um, showcasing, um, a buffet of, of healthy emotions, all emotions are healthy. John, I love it that you are, are channeling anger as a valid and a healthy emotion. Another reason that I have John Larson on is because you don't have to listen to every episode of Mormon stories. You literally cannot listen or watch the episodes that don't appeal to you. So if you are a active, faithful, believing Mormon or a Mormon with sensitive ears or a questioning Mormon who doesn't want to experience anger right now or, or swear words or anything like that, don't listen to this episode. Please stay, keep listening to Mormon stories if you find value in it, but don't feel like you have to listen to or view every episode realize that even though this episode isn't for you, there's a lot of people that are finding value in these episodes and you can always just turn it off or 
fast forward. Um, so, so those are some of the reasons why, and, and, and most importantly, I think, um, we, we need the, we need the types of things that you share John Larson. So anyway, those are, those are the reasons why I keep supporting John Larson and the Mormon expression project. And I just hope that those who, those who were worried about believing Mormons or questioning Mormons can simply understand that we'll do our best to give disclaimers so that people can opt out if they don't want it. But even if this content for you is it, even if this content isn't for you, I hope that you can, um, you can understand that it's important to a lot of people. All right. And I'm sure the current viewers and listeners are like, why are we taking the time to do this? You're <laughs> preaching to the choir. But I think it's important to, to remind people. John, what do you want to say in response to what I said? Well, thanks. I, I, agree, I agree with everything you say. And, and, and again, I think the most important point that, that, that you reiterated was it's okay to be angry. And, and oftentimes the church on, is a last parting shot will try to dictate how you actually leave their damn church. They don't get to do that. And you get to process through how you will. And, you know, I invite that um, a lot of people can benefit from talking to somebody, from talking to a therapist or, or whatever. And um, because there's a lot of, of anger and there's a lot of resentment that needs to be processed through. So thank you, John, for, um, you know, there's a lot of people who can't afford therapy or whatever, and, and, and I think this is probably the closest thing. So I appreciate being a part of your um, menagerie. Uh, my pleasure. And Nuance Ho's in the house. She says that she just got home from a funeral in Ohio. Uh, we love you, Kara, and we hope you'll join us next time. Please like this episode. Please subscribe to the Mormon Stories Podcast YouTube channel. Our growth has been amazing, and the more we grow, the more YouTube recommends us. Also, please support uh, Nuance Ho, the, her YouTube channel, and her Patreon account because she's doing great work. All right, John, what's uh, – oh, oh, and then the last thing I'll say is we've had a few Super Chats. Um, again, a power, power Line Safety Guy said, my favorite family home evening is learning from John. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, donation, Power Line Safety Guy. Um, and Ann Wilcoxon uh, donated 20 bucks. Thanks to everyone who donates to this uh, this series. And if you really want to support John Larson and Kara Burrell specifically, go to mormonstories.org slash Mormon Expression. Become a monthly contributor to the Mormon Expression podcast. And for as long as we can pay John Larson and Kara, we'll have them on. All right, John, what's next? All right. Well, let's jump in. Um, this We're going back in the Wayback Machine. Um, about 10 years ago or more, I um, wrote... The thing that we're going to be talking about it's published out there on the internet it's it's in, on several different sites um but i, I came up with a, a list of um unhealthy and controlling organizations um sort of kind of what 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 they have in common and and things to look out for and so we're going to go through that list and talk about um these items especially in relationship um to the, the mormon church there's really two deconstructions that, that, that happen or that need to happen when one um, leaves the church. And unfortunately, a lot of people only do the first one and then they, they stop. They don't go and do the second one. The first deconstruction is the realization that church is not only wrong, but they are lying and it's intentional. So, so this is the this is the whole house of cards shelf falling down that that, that every everyone talks about, and and I, I want to emphasize because because this is part of the, the 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 rage. It's not just that people are mistaken. You know, the the further you dig in, the further you realize how much has been cover ups and rewrites and all this kind of stuff. So most people kind of go there and then they they're they're free from the church and that's where they stop. The second question, which when I was deconstructing my faith back in the in the early two thousands, was once I realized, okay, this this isn't this isn't true, this isn't real. But the more important question for me is, what's going on here? Why why does this keep happening? Meaning that people keep getting involved in 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 these religions that that have all sorts of problems for the participants, for the people who live next to them, for their family, for everything. You know, why, why do we keep, as humanity, keep falling into the same um, framework? What is that framework that Mormonism is built upon? Because 
the, the the core beliefs of Mormonism that are distinct from, say, uh, mainline Christianity, if you, if, you, if you take the the differences, those things really are kind of loopy and weird. There are things like Kolob and the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price and, you know, wearing uh, Mr. Mac suits and dressing like a banker, you know, like like all, all these little, like, little weirdo things like wear white shirts and tags and not using your first name, you know, like like they're all just like like crazy stuff. But the, the, the framework that Mormonism is built on is common to not just Mormonism and other religions, but actually wider than that. So, so what is, is, is happening there? And, th and th that's the more interesting question to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the framework. And when, when you say framework, do you just mean that this idea that uh, a, 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 usually a man will claim to have some sort of theophany with God and then want to tell the world what what that man says God is thinking and then a church gets built around it and then the church starts to claim exclusive authority and the way and the only way to get to heaven and that you got to give them money and time and your reputation and uh, your lives basically along with your children to uh to be able to end up in the good place is that the framework that you're talking about john and well, that the and that the organization is likely going to be hiding its truthful history hiding its money and in some ways seeking money sex and power secretly under the guise of of helping everybody get back to a good place is that is that what you mean by the framework or something all else? of that but even even more core even more fundamental you have everything you need um, to dismantle the Mormon church by the time you have a ninth grade education um, I, in public school. Um, you, you, you have been taught the science that, that, that contradicts the church and shows that what the church believes is not real. You've been taught the basic methods of inquiry and um, scholarship that would allow you to, to, to deconstruct that. And, 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 I, and I had that when I was, you know, ninth grade, when I was 13 or 14. So why did I, you know, I went and graduated high school and, and I was a good student and went and got an, an, an undergraduate degree and was a really good student. In fact, I, I was really interested in evolution and I took every evolutionary course from every department that they had at BYU um, because I was trying to understand it. So I, I, I knew fundamentally that the, the, the narrative of the church um, just didn't stand up and yet I persisted. I stayed a believing member of the church for another decade after that. What in the world is going on there? Why, why is it, it, it seems that in an abstract um, sense, you should look at the church and say, oh, that, that's just ridiculous, and then just walk away. And, and I mean, that goes for, you look at the Catholic church. I mean, how many kids have to be molested by priests before people say, this is, there's something, there's something really scary wrong here. Look at what happened with the Dalai Lama like a, a week or two ago. Um, you know, like like what what is what is going on that we keep falling for this? And 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 what is going on that we keep um that 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 some of the worst of us keep getting promoted to lead these organizations? And and that question is the one that 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 led to what we're gonna talk about tonight. Okay. All right. So but this is still slightly different than a the episode we had recently, which is why why people kind of stick around, even it sounds like it's a cousin to the episode we recently had about why people stick around, even you know, even though you know they're it's so problematic. It's almost John like I'm I'm each episode I'm taking the same question and doing a different approach to it every time. <laughs> it's almost like there's some song in my brain that's like, is there, <laughs> is there a better way to get this point across or something like yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I want to give a call out to, um, I, I want to do a podcast um, soon on, on great books out there that will help you understand these things. But this list is not, I don't, I don't want to take credit for the list I put together. I had, I was doing wide reading, um, in a lot of, in a lot of things and a lot of, um, you know, online essays and, and academic journals. And, but I, I, I narrowed down to six books that were key for my understanding that you all might, um, might be interested in the first combating cult mind control by Steve Hassan, who was on just a few weeks, weeks ago. 
Um, uh, and he's written several books since. I think there are other, I haven't read his other books, but I'm sure they're all just as informative and, and accessible. And by the way, these books are all pretty fair, fairly easy to read it's with a, with a, with a one or two, I'll give you, um, um, a disclaimer on. So combating cult mind control by Steve, um, Hassan, why people believe weird things by Michael Shermer. It's, it's about, and, and again, I did, I will apologize. I did my research on this about 20 years ago and I have not stayed up with the latest in, you know, psychological, dark psychology and cognitive science. So I'm sure there's people out there who can post that there's better books out there now, but these are the ones that I read. Uh, Why People Believe Weird Things by Michael Shermer. The Manipulated Mind by Denise Wynn. The Manipulated Mind is a fantastic book that talks about um, um, brainwashing and, and spends a lot of time focusing on like... Um, um, states like you know China and North Korea, and the the conclusion of the book that'll scare the pants off you is you can't resist. No one can stop it. You, if you're going to get brainwashed, you're going to get brainwashed. No one can resist. Um, a, a, an, an amazing book that I would recommend to everyone is The True Believer by Eric Hoffer, and um, we probably need to do a breakdown on that book in particular. But that book, more than anything, helps you understand why there's no difference between politics, government, religion, clubs, um, all these things that, that, that exhibit these same harmful patterns over and over again. Um, this is probably the most difficult book to read. So those of you who are advanced, um, but I would highly recommend it, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by, um, by Kuhn, um, which really kind of explains how um, we kind of group think as, as human beings. And, and how it invades even things like the um, um, scientific inquiry. Um, really fascinating delve into the human mind. And the last one I'll recommend is called The Lucifer Effect, Understanding How Good People Turn Evil by um, Philip Zimbardo. Uh, this book is a tiny bit controversial, but I think it's still worth the read. Zimbardo um, did the famous Stanford um, prison experiment, and this book is all about his recounting that experiment, um, just in brief, he divided the Stanford students up into guards and um, and to prisoners. In, I think the experiment was supposed to go for two weeks down the bottom of a building, and it only took like 48 hours before they were torturing each other, and they had fully adopted um, those roles, and 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 um, and it just spun completely out of control. Very fascinating delve into human psychology. Love it. Uh, Maven, one of our viewers and listeners asked if we can um, capture John's book list in the show notes. Maven is definitely going to capture these books and put them in the show notes. John, if it's okay, I'm going to add a couple books. But first, I'm going to say we've actually landed Michael Shermer to come on Mormon Stories next month. And he's going to talk about his new book, Conspiracy. He has a new book out about conspiracy theories. And uh, we think it's important an important topic to discuss. So hopefully we're going to actually have um, Michael Shermer on Mormon Stories uh, next month. Uh, those of you who want to participate, that's part of the Mormon Stories Book Club with Rebecca Biblioteca. So grab grab that book now. Maybe, maybe Maven can paste an Amazon link to Shermer's um, book conspiracy in the show in the in the comments right now, and we can uh, we can purchase that. I'll also say, uh, John Larson, two two other books. Well, three books that I would add. Luna Lindsay Corbden has a book called Combating, uh, no, called um, Recovering Agency. That is an amazing book that identifies 31 tools that cults or high demand religions use to control people. So that's kind of a, it's basically taking uh, Robert J. Lifton and Stephen Hassan and, and others uh, and applying it to Mormonism in a really effective way. So check out, and we've done a whole series with Luna Lindsay Corbden on, uh, more, you know, is Mormonism a cult? It's like a five part series. It's so good. So please check that out. We'll make sure Maven includes that in the show notes. Two other books that, um, I'm actually surprised you didn't mention, but I think you may have even done an episode or two on these. One is called the demon haunted world. Uh, by Carl Sagan, which to me is probably the best book I've ever read about uh, why people have beliefs and, and religion and science and superstition. And then the other book is um, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me. And I think, John Larson, you did a Mormon Expression episode on that book. Is that right? Yeah, I, I was trying to keep the list low, low um, but um, <laughs> uh, Luna, uh, brilliant, absolutely recommend um, their book. Um, um, 
mistakes were made um, is is a, is a is an absolutely fantastic one. It's a little bit outside of what we're talking about here. That's one of the reasons I lit it. And and the demon haunted world. If you were just going to read one book, if you left the church and you're only going to read one book, yeah. read the demon haunted world, and it'll give you chills because at the end he predicts everything that's happening in our world right now. He yeah. wrote it. It was published in 1996, right before he passed away. Um, and he foresaw our day. Yeah. Anyway, I wasn't trying to one up you, but I just had to share a couple. No, that's that a great contribution. Thanks, John. Meant a lot to me. Okay. All right. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the word cult. I've already used it twice, I think, and and which is kind of funny because I don't like the term. Um, and there's there's a couple reasons I don't like the term, but it's important to get this out. Um, one, I think that the term is primarily used by evangelicals. Um, you know, even, even like some of our friends, like Utah lighthouse ministries, um, I've, I've enjoyed my association with them. I, I enjoy talking to them. Um, um, but I've never get past the fact that they, they have the same problems they point to in the, in the, in the church. So oftentimes it's, it's weaponized in a way to make Mormonism seem like an illegitimate version of Christianity. And, and that I fundamentally disagree with when I read, um, the new Testament, I would say they're all fundamentally in disagreement with, with, uh, Christianity. So Mormonism is not in a particular way outside of the mainstream of Christianity in my view. Um, now those who accept the council of Nicaea and the council of Trent and stuff will disagree with me, but oh, well, it's my show. Um, the <laughs> second one, um, uh, on, on, um, on, uh, is, is it, it's getting bantered around a lot and, and it's, it's basically used to describe any organization where a leader or authority manipulates a small group of people. Um, and the, 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 the problem is if you define it so loosely, if, if everything's a cult, then nothing's a cult. Um, but you know, cause you, so, so, so it, 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 that's why, that's why I'd rather see lists like this to tell you there's healthy and unhealthy things and say categorically Mormonism is a cult or it's not a cult because the word cult in, in the common usage is, is really a plastic word. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that Stephen Hassan likes to do, and we actually, you know, th those of you who recently uh, checked out Mormon stories will will remember uh, that we had him on. I'm just going to go ahead and share the way Stephen Hassan likes to talk about it is is through what he calls an influence continuum. And so I'll just share um, I'll just share the link and I'll try and explode it a little bit. But the idea uh, is that all organizations, if you want to have a little bit more of a nuanced conversation about this, it's that all organizations fit along kind of a spectrum from healthy and constructive to unhealthy and destructive. And what he likes to do is put uh, on on the healthy side, you know, things to look out for, for a healthy organization. And I'm sure a lot of these, John, you're going to cover, so I'm not going to read them all here. And then on the other side is destructive. So whether or not we call Mormonism a cult or the Catholic Church a cult or the U.S. military a cult or the Republican Party a cult or a Democratic Party a cult or Mormon Stories podcast a cult, that's a distraction from us learning sort of healthy organization literacy such that we can put our marriage, our someone we're dating, our employer, our yoga instructor, we need to be able to figure out just where to put them on the continuum of healthy, unhealthy, constructive, or destructive. And and that's probably a little bit more uh, useful than just this binary in or out, cult or not cult, that can sometimes not get us get us where we need to go. Right, right. And, and some of these need to be kind of a wake-up call because you, they don't pull out the branding iron. <laughs> On, on your day one in a cult, you know, that, that comes down, down, right. the, down the road. Yeah. Of course, I'm referring to Nexium. Um, that, so, so I, I, I would invite even the believers who are listening to, to really listen to this le list and, and question. Well, maybe with no further ado, let's uh, jump in. Okay, let's jump in. And um, I wrote this, uh, sometimes we find ourselves in organization, governments, and communities that might be psychologically unhealthy 
to us or to our communities. As a public service, I've written a few points you can use to check to see if an organization might be considered dangerous or unhealthy, hence the title of the podcast. And I gave you kind of where I got this, and let's go. Number one, there are elections with only one candidate for each office. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I think that one is so funny because it would obviously, you know, you know, growing up in, in the Mormon corridor, the Morador, as we call it, um, and, you know, you'd go to class with a whole bunch of Mormons and they'd, they would laugh at like Soviet style elections where you could only vote for, you know, the, the Politburo as it's presently constituted. And we would use that as a, as a de facto proof that the Soviet, um, government was not, was, was incorrect and, and danger and the enemy. And then we'd go to conference and we'd all vote, um, with, with, with a single candidate. And, and which also ties into my number two, which is all members are expected to vote in unison in public. Um, those two things um, work work hand in hand. Um, the, the, the reason is when, when you have to vote in public and there is a moment where raise your hand to the square and, and whatever, and everybody bow your head and say yes, whatever it is they're doing, there is such um, pressure um, put on people to conform that the the nonconformity is basically completely unheard of that that hardly anybody unless they're trying to make a um, a particular point and they always get escout, escorted out by the um the the church police who carry guns and um and do some other shady things um if 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 you go to conference and vote no you will in fact be escorted out by a couple of thugs who are fully armed um and 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 so that's okay. um okay. that's so the reality you, of it you should be able to have choice about your leadership and you should be able to vote in secret such that no um there's no intimidation or coercion to choose quote the right candidate i mean i'm thinking about china i'm thinking about russia um and uh yeah i'm thinking about general conference basically you well, know, or even the political Korea, parties in the, in the United Korea. States, you know, that, that we, we sometimes have two people to choose from, but not really. Those are chosen. And I'm not, I'm not saying that means the United States is a cult. I'm saying that's unhealthy. Right. Um, it, it, and, and, and the reason it's unhealthy is because it takes the trappings of democracy. It takes the trappings of that this is a community choosing its leaders. It is looking at what a healthy organization does, and it is, it is as the church likes to talk about, it's a false priesthood. It's a false election. And then they can say, well, you know, it, it looks like all the votes are, 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 you know, in the affirmative. We are, we are reigning in complete unison again. And it, it's, it's all a complete lie that nothing ever happens in unison. In fact, in the Bible, if, uh, what was the, the, the Sanhedrin, the, the, the council, um, of elders, if they all voted together, then the, the, the vote was considered a no vote. It was. It was like if everybody agrees, then something's going on. There's shenanigans. This is not truth. Mm, yeah. Okay. Those are those are good indicators. What what comes next? Okay. The term "beloved" is applied to a living leaders by other leaders of the organization. I cannot imagine a bigger ass kicking, ass kissing, suck up, um, brown nose, toady, boot licking term than calling your superior beloved jesus christ i mean the, the the if you were in any organization and you heard like a manager refer to his beloved i'm talking about not somebody who retired you know like a beloved old man who used to run the company i'm talking about referring to the current line leader as beloved something's going on that is not right Okay, so t tell in, in in the Mormon context when when do we do that? Tell us when we do that. They do it all the time. They they the if you listen to the the seventy, you listen to the twelve. They'll talk about our beloved prophet. They'll talk about our beloved leader. And you know who else uses the term beloved every time they're referring to their leader? Like fucking North Korea does. Um, it's it's just it's one of those things that when you're an outsider and you hear the insiders talk about their beloved leader. Um, if you don't believe me, just go do a text search on, on, you know, on, I'm not saying you don't believe me, John, just on, on conference talks. They use the term beloved all the time. Yeah. It seems like when somebody's, you know, if you're talking about your grandma, that's fine. If you're talking about your grandpa, even your mom, once she's older, 
I think what I hear you saying, John, is that if it's somebody wielding massive amounts of power with a lot of wealth, it, then then forcing everyone or, or developing a culture to view and refer to someone as beloved is giving is giving them way too much power. If somebody has super amounts of wealth and power, they should probably be referred to with checks, with balances, with suspicion, with skepticism, because, you know, when they sneeze, people die, right? Right. And so, and so I, I, is that, is that what this is about, John, is that calling someone beloved when they're wielding power just gives them disproportionate power? Well, yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree with all that. And also just is based on the term love, right? You love your grandma. Your grandma has been there for you. She changed your diapers probably. She's helped um, She's helped calm you when you had a skin knee. She's given you presents and cards that have $5 in them. Everybody loves grandma. Like, like their, love is a true emotion, and, and grandma loves everybody. But when we're talking about these these guys in Salt Lake City who are so far removed, what, how many people do they claim are in the church these days? I don't know. It's all made up numbers. Seventeen million. 17 Twenty-two million. billion or whatever. Seven, Seventeen, 17 million. million. Yeah. Um. 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 That 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 there is anything akin to a, an emotion or a state of being that can be described as love between that leader and the people going to the church is a farce. It's a misuse of the term love. I can't love somebody who I've never even met and who is, is you know, the, the king is dead, God save the king. It's just the next person fulfilling the same role, fulfilling the same role. And all characteristics and anything that would be lovely or lovable about the person are erased. You are just forced to state and forced to act like and forced to be as if you're in a loving relationship with this guy and you're not and he's not. You don't know him, he don't know you. Yeah, and I guess I guess that that's part of it is it's a it's a carefully curated image. There are massive P armies of PR people that are that are filtering uh, and and buffing up the image of this prophet. He's not allowed. You know, we're not allowed to look behind the scenes. He's intentionally kept removed from us. We don't get to see where the bodies are buried. There are massive levels of non-disclosure agreements and secrecy behind whatever body trail he may have of how he's behaved and how he's acted. There's a culture of terror about speaking out uh, about what people might really know about them. And so you, you don't, like you said, John, you don't really know him. You just know the image that the that the PR people in the in the two hundred fifty billion dollar organization have a, have allowed you to have of them through you know through decades of curation, right? Absolutely, well, I mean, yeah. well stated. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next one: loyal members calling for reform or change are purged or otherwise silenced. Um, and you know, John, y you and I have been doing this long enough that we know personally people who have been excommunicated for things that are allowed now <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, oh, yeah. The, even even not not just in our lifetimes in our broadcast times yeah. since we started doing this <laughs> and how many of those people john has the church gone back and said you know we excommunicated for this um and it's now legal we're going to reinstate you in the church how many cases do you know of uh that'd be zero there zero. have been a few like Avram Gileadi or Maxine Hanks that were allowed to get rebaptized, but there's never been like a public apology. It's more like they had to recant and or uh, ingratiate, re ingratiate themselves and, and repent for what they did. But the church uh, would never apologize. In fact, Dallin H. Hooks is on record saying we neither seek nor offer apologies. So, like, right. the, even the Catholic Church. What they would apologize for what they did to um, Gal Galileo, what in the 14th or 15th century? The Mormon Church is still too immature to do something like that. Right. Yeah. There's a there's a great example, um, and I've used it before. If you go down to the Mountain Meadows massacre site, um, the church owns the main site, and then the state owns the the hill up above it. 
And if you go down to the main site, you'll see this big um, phallic penis pagoda thing. And, and, and you read the plaque, and the plaque will tell you a story about how Gordon B. Hinckley dedicated this pagoda. Uh, <laughs> the, and, but if you go up top... Um, where the church doesn't have influence, you see this this stone wall that has the names of all the victims um, I'm, I'm carved into it. Um, the, uh, and and I, 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 I think that's telling. You know, here, one of the worst massacres um, that, um, that, you know, came from, from this, this time period. Um, and, 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 and there is no apology from the church, even though it's been demonstrated again and again and again that the church ordered this and the church um, had people take fall, but 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 that, that's just that's just an, an an example of the fact that they never apologize. But you know, my statement is that loyal members calling for reform. There has never been an organization on the face of the earth that is not needed to reform and change as new knowledge comes to light as things happen. No organization stays completely static. And, and the fact that the church has no problem silencing the loyalists who oftentimes want change for things that are problematic, that, that, that the first instinct is always to go for blood. It's always to purge people, even when it's known that they are right, that what they're saying is right and good. The church will stay with the church before it will ever stick with any kind of moral position. Yeah. And for those who are kind of new, for the half of you who have never been Mormon and don't know the history, or for all of those who are new, I can just rifle off a bunch of names. I, I was excommunicated in 2015 for Mormon Stories Podcast and for advocating for the LGBTQ community. Bill Real was excommunicated. He's another fellow Mormon-themed podcaster. Leah and Cody Young were excommunicated. Carson and uh, Marisa Calderwood were excommunicated. Kate Kelly was excommunicated for advocating for feminism. Natasha Helfer was excommunicated for advocating for sexual health and um, you know, eth ethical, empirical, uh, medical-based of uh, you know mental health practices within the church. Uh, J Jeremy Runnels would have been excommunicated if he hadn't have resigned for uh just for speaking truth about the church's history that the church had covered up for almost two centuries grant palmer was disfellowshipped and was going to be excommunicated um for writing his book that was a factual book about the problems with joseph smith and his history not to mention the september 6 michael quinn paul toscano margaret toscano maxine hanks i mean there's just dozens and dozens and dozens of thoughtful critics who were right who were on the right side of history who the church excommunicated because they didn't want to hear any criticism. They just don't tolerate public criticism. And just recently I had, you know, Patrick Mason or, or Jenna Reese, you know, in a, in a news show on Mormon stories podcast. And I'll just, I can just tell you, they're terrified to criticize the brethren because they know that they'll be punished for it and marginalized and or excommunicated for directly criticizing church leaders. And it's, it's a real deal in Mormonism. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so th uh, that that is the sign of an unhealthy organization that can't take any insider input into things that need to get better. Okay. Um, there are no means for membership to appeal a decision. Um, this is a, absolutely a sign of an unhealthy organization. Um, if if you um, if your stake president is is terrible, and this gets the church in trouble all the time. Because they have stake presidents and bishops who are molesting kids, but there is no mechanism. And 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 there have been multiple times where the brethren have bragged from conference that if you write a letter to them, they just send it right back to the stake president. Never the thought being that the stake president or the or the bishop might be might be the one having a problem. Bishops can single handedly excommunicate females on their own volition. And of course, bishops can ask females whatever they want, and they do ask them whatever they want. And whatever it is you're thinking, it's worse than that. They'll, they, and I, I know questions I've been ask, asked um, by, by bishoprics, and they involve like, 
I'm not, I, I, I know I'm crude, but I don't even want to get that crude. Like, but there's, there's absolutely zero recourse. There's no way. And of course, famously, we found out this last couple of years that even if you call the helpline, um, to report abuse, you're just ringing Curtin and McConkie. Um, you're just talking to the church's lawyers. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I, I should have mentioned Sam Young is someone who is excommunicated. What was he excommunicated for? He had served as a Mormon bishop. He knew that what Mormon bishops were doing, asking 12 year old girls about their sexual, you know, um, you know, behaviors behind a closed door, one-on-one, -on -one. he tried it every other way he could think of to get the church to just change. Um, and, and of course they excommunicated him literally for fighting to end a sexual abuse of children and young adults and ecclesiastical abuse within the church. And, and I'll just say, for those who don't know how, how the church complaint system works is you're supposed to go to your bishop. Um, but if your bishop <coughs> doesn't like your complaint, he can punish you in the ward. But if you go over the bishop's head to go to the stake president, the stake president is more often than not going to back up the bishop. And then you're stuck back being railroaded and marginalized because you went over your bishop's head. If you go over your stake president's head and you, for heaven forbid, write an area authority or a general authority or an apostle of the church, tell them, John Larson, what the church's policy is if you complain above the level of a stake president. I, what, what is their official policy? I'm not, I'm not certain. They send the letter back to your stake president. Oh yeah. I knew they, they did that, but I didn't know that was their policy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's officially how it works. Stake, pre, you know, above general authorities will not, uh, address grievances, um, except in super rare cases. All they do is send your letter back to your stake president who then, uh, is super pissed off that you went over their head because they're, you know, uh, oftentimes gunning for a better leadership position later. So there's no real um, way to appeal any abuse that's happening on your local level. You're just caught in this um, in this cycle um, of, of patriarchy where you get stepped on if you just keep speaking up. And I can't tell you, John Larson, I'm sure you've seen this as well, how many people were noticing sexual abuse cover-ups in their ward or their stake and when they tried to uh, get these things solved, because it was the bishops or the stake presidents who were covering up the sexual abuse, uh, the, the church do not want to hear the appeals. Um, they, they, they want you to follow whatever your bishop or stake president say, which is keep it quiet, don't go to the police, let's deal with this internally, which means not deal with it at all. Yeah, in, in my local area, I've, been, I've lived out here long enough to meet um, some of the ex-Mormons and some of the Mormons, um, it was over a decade ago, but um, the, a, a scoutmaster um, working for the church was abusing boys, and the um, local congregations covered it up, but it got it got exposed, and they lost a lot of membership and a lot of goodwill. There's a lot of people around here who the only thing they know about the church is that they, they cover up for molesting uh, um, scoutmasters, um, but they do. They, 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 circle, they circle the wagons. Yeah. Um, Re really quickly, John, I just want to share a couple Super Chats. Uh, Daniel John Kerry said, thank you for having John Larson on. He speaks what former members, Mormons feel. The anger is valid. He covers issues TBMs need to consider. People are dying from false beliefs. The LDS suicide rate is high. Truth must be told. Thank you, Daniel John Kerry, for that donation. Uh, Brett Nordquist, Nordquist writes, I always enjoy listening to John Larson. Thank you for having him on Mormon Stories regularly. Thanks to everyone who's donating because your donations uh, through YouTube, the stars feature on Facebook, and your direct donations, recurring donations at mormonstories.org slash Mormon Expression. Help keep this podcast alive and help help us be able to uh, compensate John Larson for his good work. All right, John Larson, what do you got next? All right, thank you. Let's see. Um, the, the group is willing to break up families or other social structures to further or preserve its own organizations. Okay, that's and, the next unhealthy thing. Yeah, this, that's the next unhealthy thing. And this one is particularly pernicious for the church because they devote so much rhetoric to the family, that the family is, 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 is primary. And, and what's funny is if, is if you can give money to the church all the time, you know, day in and day out, fast offerings and tithing 
and fundraisers and blue and gold banquets and on and on and on and on. And the church brags on the news about the, the big, you know, screen silos. There's one up in Davis County. There's one in Salt Lake County right next to the right next to the freeway. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're supposedly part of the church welfare um, program. Um, but if you actually need something from the church, the first thing they'll say is, well, go to your family first. Go ask your family members first for support, even though you've probably never been given your brother, um, you know, a twenty dollar check every 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 four weeks. Um, so the church hides behind this shield of family all the time, but the church will go after the family first. And and it was one of their missteps from not that long ago, within the last decade, where they um started to say if if um, unless you you turn on your parents. Oh, you can't get baptized. You know, like they actively in, in like full frontal attack the family unit. So, 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 which is of course a sign that, that, that happens in almost every cult and every unhealthy organization in the, in, 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 um, Pol Pot in, in, in Cambodia, encourage people to turn in their family members. The third Reich, um, sent people after, after their fam family and neighbors, um, uh, and uh, virtually every cult does this. We can go on and on and on and on um, where where if, if, if you're an organization that uses as one of its chief tools trying to break people away from their parents, from their spouses, um, you're, 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 you're not a healthy place. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's either Lifton or, or Hassan who, who calls it doctrine over the individual or theology over the individual or the church's well-being over the individual. And and that's a it's it's really a crucial component. And this is a hard one because organ organizations are always going to tend to to look after uh their own health. And so you almost can't be a part of any organization without falling prey to the organization operating under its own best interests. But I guess in in the spirit of the spectrum the more that an organization is willing to step on people to protect its own best interests, the, the less healthy it is, right, John? Well, and, yeah, and specifically targeting. You could argue that if you're working for an unhealthy um, uh, company that's wanting you to spend 60, 80 hours a week and, and it is, is impacting your family, but that's different than them saying, hey, you know, your husband's ugly and he smells bad. You need to come be here. And, and the church does the equivalent of that all the time for marginalized groups, and it, it, it encourages breakups. Matter of fact, the church in the last 10 years shot itself in the foot in a major way with, um, with millennials and with Gen Z. They went on a big campaign to try to villainize um, pornography. Of course, um, pornography usage, depending on your, your attitude about pornography, is epidemic. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the numbers are, are um, the majority of women and almost every man looks at pornography on at a, at a, a regular basis. Um, but the church used that about with young people, and they, they spent a whole lot of time policing, t teaching women to police men there you can hear a lot of stories about relief society meetings where they they would they would show how to you know break in and see the um search history of their husbands and all this kind of stuff well what what it did is it alienated a whole bunch of people from marriage because you've got these 24 year old men who are obviously jerking off because that's what god intended um you know so they don't go rape everything in the world and and um and then you've got these these women who may want to get married to them but both these two have been socialized to unless there's no pornography anywhere in the relationship that they can't have they can't have a relationship that's just one example where the church targets what could otherwise be healthy, normal relationships um, to accomplish its own means. And what are the means? It wants everybody to feel broken so that they have to constantly be asking for the church because the church says, well, it's, it's the, 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 the um, forgiveness or salvation comes through the atonement of Jesus Christ, and we are the gatekeepers of that. We're the only ones who can, who can administer that. Uh, no, I don't remember any place in the New Testament where Jesus said that. Got it. Okay. All right. What's next? This is good. All right. Um, members are encouraged to look and dress the same. Uniformity is encouraged or required in clothing, haircuts, jewelry, etc. 
Mm. Um, this is particularly stark um, when you're on a mission. Um, you know, you're you're not allowed to use each other's names. You can't use your, each other's first names. Um, you know, if you skip shaving for a day, if you don't cut your hair, if you don't dress exactly the same as everybody else, you know, um, it, then then you're ostracized or or you're questioned about your loyalty to your organization and 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 righteousness. And and Mormons have a lot of these. There's a great old talk and um, by Boyd K. Packer called the Unwritten Order of Things. I would recommend everybody go. Uh, Google that thing right now and and read it and and you know and of course always 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 this stuff goes after women much more than men women are policed much more and the fact that that the church has opinions on all sorts of things from underwear to earrings to necklaces to makeup to hairstyles to tattoos none of it have any reason or or bearing on the Book of Mormon or Joseph Smith's doctrine or Christian theology, it's just another layer of control. Yeah, and I think organizations are highly successful when they have kind of a brand and a brand identity. And uh, because if you're visually identifiable, um, you know, th then you start becoming more memorable. And, you know, there's, there's a, no clearer artistic rendering of this concept than the Book of Mormon musical that starts out with these Mormon missionaries literally taking a page from the IBM of the 1950s playbook with the white shirts and the ties and the and the suits and the and the slacks and the clean cut hair no facial hair it's literally the church is like we got to get rid of this polygamous identity with beards and and hats and canes let's adopt the American IBM identity and then fast forward 50 or 60 years, and that's part of our brand. It's recognizable, and there's brand value. It's why McDonald's has uniforms. It's why, um, you know, so many different you know uh, entities have uniforms. But the other thing is behavioral control. Stephen Hassan talks a lot about um, the bite model that cults are going to control behavior, information, thoughts, and then manipulate you with emotions. But if they can get you to cut your hair, to not pierce your ears, to not shave your beard, to not show your shoulders, to put on the holy underwear, to dress with the white shirt, what they're doing is they're conditioning you to behave, to conform and behave. And that's why they need to have such harsh and strict appearance and behavioral controls so that you become conditioned to comply, to obey, and to do whatever you're told, and to help lift up the brand. Um, that that's that's kind of how I see it. That probably sounds a little bit cynical, but that's kind of how I see it. No, I, I think I think you're spot on. Um, yeah, and and then then it, it also allows, and you're you're, you're implying this. I just want to uh, riff on a little bit. It also um, um, sets a, a tight culture where you're not actually looking in the manual to figure out what to do. You're looking to your left and to your right. That, that you're, you're really, you don't want to stand out. You want to be conformative. You want to talk like other people talk. You want to bear your testimony like other people bear your testimony. And then what's actually written in the, in the, in the books doesn't matter, which gives, of course, the organization power because they can, they can call an audible whenever they want and do whatever they want. But what, what, what really is happening starkly is you're giving up your identity. Um, there's that's a reason why they don't allow missionaries to use their first name because in our culture we use their first name. If you want people to give up their identity, first thing you do is get them to, um, to give up give up their name. That's why the the first thing they do in basic, you know, when you go into the military, is 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 they 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 stop calling you by they don't call you David or or Mary or whatever. They'll they'll they'll, they'll do something else. Yep. Yeah. It's important. Okay. Um, life events next on to the next one. Life events are controlled by the organization. For example, you cannot marry without leadership approval. So the organization will take all the major milestones in one's life and they will, um, they, they will not just, um, when you, when you're talking about a cult, they won't just officiate at them like most religions do. Um, they will put condition on, on them. Um, and they'll do it in ways that are very controlling and very cruel. Um, 
my ex-wife and I, before we got married, um, we had fooled around a little bit. We hadn't actually had um, penis and vagina sex, but we had kind of um, played around a little bit, as people do. And I think we did like once. So we went to the bishop, brokenhearted, and confessed. And the bishop said, um, well, I've got to think about it. Now, what he has to think about is if he's going to actually let us get married. Right. Um, we had invitations that were out. We had halls that were booked. We had thousands of dollars on the line. And he just let us swing there until about five or six days before the wedding, ensuring that if he had decided to tell us we couldn't get married, which many bishops do, it would ensure the absolute maximum humiliation for us. Right? Yeah. And, and and that's, you know, that just puts the fear, literally the fear of God into you. And it's not just about that wedding, which they were clearly controlling. And by the way, there are bishops or stake presidents that say, you're not getting married. You're not going on your mission. You're not going to have a temple recommend. You're not going to be able to go to your sibling or your parents or your children's own wedding as well. Right, you're not going to be able to sit, stand in the circle where your baby's blessed. You're mm -hmm. not going to be able to ordain. You know, when my when my uh, when my dad was disfellowshipped, he wasn't able to ordain me a deacon, and how shaming that was to my dad. Right, um, you know, because they didn't like certain behavior of his, and so, you know, not only does it put the fear of God into you, not only does it control those life events. But it just makes you know that you gotta, you gotta um, conform, you gotta behave, or the church has power over you. Much like with Scientology and auditing, they learn all these secrets about you so that they are free to use them against you later if you ever step out of line. Right, right, and and this is a pernicious one. I want to pause on a little bit for for ex Mormons because I talked in the beginning about how they um, they um, try to break up families. This is one of the ways they do it. Um, I've I've met with and talked to multiple ex Mormons where you have this dilemma when it comes to like baby blessings or baptisms. If if you, if you're a male, you're going to be expected to participate. And I have actually been in ward uh, meetings where the 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 men got up to form the circle to bless the baby and one of the fellows stayed sitting down and they and they're like come on come on they're they're pausing the meeting like signaling them up come on come on up here come come participate um and and on a personal level that happened that happened to me there was a, a baptism but i was in deep faith crisis i did not feel comfortable participating but but they're 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 gonna they're gonna call you non-participatory and creating problems in your family by not going. They will call cause problems and and accuse you of things if you go and participate and they later find out you didn't believe or more likely you don't feel comfortable participating and you're gonna be forced into it, which makes you feel kind of terrible. Or an even third example is they have somebody participate and then they later find out, oh, um, oh, this person had lost their faith. How dare you invalidate the baptism of my children? How dare you um, bring your filthy soul to, to this baby blessing? So, so it's this trap that a lot of people just throw their hands up and say, I'm, I, I can't leave the church because it'll be too much social and familial damage. Yeah. And that's real, and it's especially real along the Wasatch Front, where if you're, we've talked about this on, on our episodes with you, John, if you're a dentist or an attorney, or, you know, you've got any business dealings at all uh, that are, you know, where you rely upon the business or the support or even partnership uh, with fellow Mormons, which is very, very common, then the stakes are even higher, and you can't afford the public embarrassment. And so you either pay the money or obey the rules just to keep the peace, or you learn to lie, um, which in some cases can even have worse mental health and familial and social and personal outcomes in the long run. Right. Okay. Um, next one. Uh, there um, is organizationally controlled media, including television, radio, and newspapers. All outside media is cast as suspect. And this is absolutely true for the church. It owns a lot of media, a lot more media than um, it just serves its, its content on. 
but um, it 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 owns the, the major newspaper. You know, um, um, the 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 Deseret News, of course, KSL TV, KSL Radio, Bonneville International, um, and a lot of people are surprised how many radio stations, like even pop music radio stations. Um, they own both in, in Salt Lake and in the West. I know a few years ago, about 10 years ago, they announced they were going to divest of a lot of those, but I haven't seen any sign that they have. But frankly, I haven't kept up on it. But they definitely control the media um, inside inside the Mormon corridor. And there are a lot of people who refuse to read anything who will not look at the Salt Lake Tribune. They believe the Salt Lake Tribune is evil and a vehicle of, of Satan. And they will only basically look at the Deseret News and Fox News, unfortunately. Okay. So you're saying you're saying that they do their best to control the information that the members have access to. Would you add to that Deseret Book, for example, and telling members to buy books you know, if you can try and buy approved books from Deseret Book or the BYU Bookstore, etc. Of course, and we could tell the dark, dark story that needs to be told, John. Um, how twenty years ago the church did a campaign to put every L every private LDS bookseller out of business, and put and ended um you know Bookcraft and Covenant and all these Siegel you, Siegel Book right Siegel Book. There used to be yeah. this rich tapestry of of publishers who would publish this and the church would systematically and and forcefully um force them out of business in in dirty ways i've talked to some of these guys this somebody needs to write the book about this it was it was a gross part of 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 mormon history and and yeah they they don't have any problem using using all of this stuff and you know people might say hey the church has never told me i can't read usa today or pravda or whatever it is and and that's that's true They're, they they do it in in different ways they they put um a, a different spin on things but a, a lot of a lot of uh, members of dangerous organizations like this just kind of look to it and say, well, you know, the smart people, there's all those scientists at BYU who still believe, so I should believe. The The church has a has a television station, and, and they're broadcasting the news at 1030, so I, I guess they're they're not a cult, you know? So, so, so the media is used as, as a, as a way of um, soft peddling or kind of whitewashing what's, what's going on behind the scene. Yeah. And this is in the bite model. This is the I, this is the information control. And within Mormonism, what, what I've found to be interesting, John, you, you know, you could have argued that Fawn Brody's No Man Knows My History has been around, which is a, which is probably the best biography of Joseph Smith ever written. You know, it's been around since the mid-1940s, but you had to go to a library. You had to know that the book exists, and then you mm -hmm. had to go to a library to check it out. It probably wasn't, there was no Amazon, and it probably wasn't available at a local bookstore. Um, so, you know, but, but it was still available. What I've been impressed by in a dark way, you know, over the past 20 years, is how effective the church has been at sort of surrounding Mormon minds with a bubble of information protection and prohibition during the internet age, because there are all sorts of very popular and well-known internet resources, podcasts, PDFs, the CES letter, YouTube channels, TikTok channels, that, that many, 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 the majority of active Mormons today still have never heard of, even in 2023. And, and it has nothing to do with, with KSL, or the Deseret News, it has to do with the learned helplessness that the Mormon church has programmed <clears throat> into the minds and hearts of its members, telling them to fear any unofficial source, regardless yeah. of where it comes from. Well, uh, if you talk to librarians in, in Utah, they will tell you that, that oftentimes books like No Man Knows My History are stolen from the libraries at regular intervals. So, so, so here is, is, you know, that's one of the 10 commandments, right? But, but, but the, the members get so twisted in their thoughts, the church doesn't have to do anything. All the church has to do is, 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 um, just let it happen, you know, and, um, those sort of things usually don't get condemned. Um, right. all right. Yeah. Moving forward. All right. Um, 
the organization is overly focused on winning over vulnerable popul populations, such as the youth, those who are grieving, or those in financial distress. And anybody who's honest with themselves, who's been on a mission, know that missionaries actively target and um, go after vulnerable populations. If we're if we're thinking about like Scientology, you know, they literally start out with, uh, or not just Scientology, but Nexium, right? They start out with with just like self help, mm -hmm. and they usually like Scientology has an amazing drug uh, drug abuse addiction and recovery program. Uh, they often they do they target the vulnerable, um, and who knows who knows whether in their heart of hearts they want the best for people and for them it's just a way to serve, but whether it's the impoverished people of Africa or Latin America or the Philippines. In terms of the Mormon Church, whether it's drug addicts, whether it's poor people, whether it's Catholic missions to, you know, developing countries as a part of of colonialism or even imperialism, you you always start by targeting the vulnerable. You get them in, you get them part of the social network, and then slowly they become so grateful to the institution for helping improve their lives that they'll give the rest of their lives and their children and their grandchildren to the organization. Now, John, here's the, here's one glitch that I'm sure you know of, which is that, is that there, there are many people who would say at the, on their deathbed who converted to Mormonism in their twenties or thirties in Guatemala or Mexico, I'm super glad that, that I joined the Mormon church because it lifted me out of poverty. I'm sure a lot of these people converting to the Mormon church in Africa, are going to die super grateful saying that their life got better the moment they joined the Mormon church. Isn't that a, a paradox or a conundrum that vexes you sometimes, John? Never. <laughs> you can go down to the South and go to these beautiful plantations that are still spoken of in hushed terms and they have tours and how wonderful plantation life was. If if you were part of the family at the top, it was it was it was a it was a a great but a great way to live, I guess, if you like wealth and riches and being waited on and all that. But it's built literally on the blood and backs of of an enslaved population in the the lands that were taken from an indigenous people. Like you can point out with any organization, be it like like. The, the, the Luftwaffe and the SS had beautiful homes in Bavaria, you know, and, 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 and what a, what a, what, a, and, and Bavaria is a beautiful country and what a beautiful way of life. It was fantastic. It was built on fucking blood. So, so the fact that some people benefit, hell, somebody always benefits from every Ponzi scheme. And, and, and the fact that it, the, the idea that it should be some kind of moral conundrum that there's a group of people who are taking from another group of people and their lives are better for it. Like, like I would be embarrassed to make the argument that, well, I can see there's problems with the church, but it's really good for me and my family. Fuck you. Like what, 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 what is that? You know, it's like, Hey, there's been a rash of robberies down this street. Well, I've got a bunch of new stuff in my garage, but things are a lot better for me. So I guess it's okay. Taking, from people who are forced to give, like uh, native populations, like those who are literally enslaved, like those who don't have money but are forced to pay 10% of their tithing. This is nothing to be proud of. This is nothing to brag about. Your riches are built on blood. Stop pointing to them. It makes you look like a dick. Did you just call me a dick, John Larson? No, not you, John. <laughs> Really quickly, let me just thank a few of our Super Chat uh, donors who are loving what you do, John Larson. Mike Pat Patterson, thanks for that donation. Emily M. writes, I really appreciate all the research and passion John Larson brings to each episode. Thanks for the Super Chat, Emily M. And LJ writes, thank you both for enlightening us and sharing truth about Mormonism. Mormonism is frightening and oppressive. You are blessed to have gotten out. Um, yeah, and everyone who is uh, using that YouTube feature to to support this program financially, we really appreciate it. All right, John, what's next? All right. Um, 
Let's see. The group is involved in many businesses or monetary transactions wholly unrelated to the central mission of the organization. Um, that's a, this that's is, a sign of an unhealthy organization. The, uh, ab absolutely, because what is what does the church do? Like, like, like. There's a um, um, when when I when I um, I, I have an MBA. I, I, I uh, which is which is kind of funny when I get in all these arguments about socialism and stuff. There, there's a there is a an exercise that a good healthy business does, which is they take their core mission, and then they draw a connection line. Like I'm the one who makes the widgets. I'm the one who who makes sure that the people who make the widgets get paid. I'm the one who supervises the person who makes sure the people who get the widgets gets paid. I'm the one who's the director over the person who manages the person who pays. And and you can start taking out from that core mission and seeing how how much an organization has um, access, how much it needs to it needs it needs to cut. And when you start having things that people do in the organization that have no relationship whatsoever, the, the, the Mormon church has the, the largest single cattle operation in the United States in Florida. Why? Right. The Mormon church has, um, has outside of up by Randolph, up in the, the north uh, east corner of the state, up in the little tab, they own these huge sections of land. And I know this from personal firsthand account. And they have a herd of docile elk. Okay, this is the church owns. These are domesticated elk. And then what they do is they fly bigwigs up there who meet with some guides, and then they release these elk out of the pens, and they make sure that the, the rich people don't see. And then they go and they shoot an elk so that they can mount it on their wall and tell the story about how they're the, the big old elk killer. That's an operation that the church runs right now today. Mm. Why? Because the church's core mission is not anything to do with the Beatitudes or with what Jesus taught. The church's core mission is making money, and they will do what they need to do to make money. So, so if, if you want to see what people actually believe, just look and see where their money is. And, and, and that's true with the church. So if you have a core mission that you're telling everybody that you do, but where you actually invest your money and your time and your resources are in other places, that's a sign that this is not a healthy organization. Okay. So, so are you saying that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, somebody said that once. I forget who. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and for those of you who haven't checked out our Widow's Might episodes uh, recently, there's this amazing report that's come out called the Widow's Might Report that is uh, reporting on the assets of the Mormon Church, the investments of the Mormon Church, the deceptions in the investments of the Mormon Church, the real estate holdings. I, it, John, I don't know if you, John Larson, even if you know this, but they're they're actually now going to every single state to see where the Mormon Church ranks in terms of uh, being the top real estate owner of the state. And I'm going to get this wrong, but it's I, I think it's don't quote me on this, but I think it's looking like the Mormon Church is anywhere between the first and the third top real estate owning entity in like almost all fifty of the U.S. states. Uh, it doesn't surprise me. And there's there's a lot of stories. You can look in the archives of the Tribune. You can read about the church engaging in all sorts of practices to get properties condemned by people who own them. There's been lots of stories where um, some um, elderly woman is living in a house and her husband, unknown unknown to her, bequeathed, is that the word, the, the property to the church. And the church just goes in and hardcore um, um, evicts her. Um, the, the, the church is, is as much of a, of a, of a landlord as anybody else is. They, 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 they do the same thing. Mm. But the reason that's important here is it, because it's, it's, it's just off of the core mission. And, and when you're writing your check and all the guilt and shame and things they put on that, that's the Lord's money, but they don't have any qualms whatsoever um, spending the, the, the Lord's money on, you know, 30 out six ammunition for rich guys. 
All right. Yeah. And, and the Mormon church has a serious problem with this. And so does Scientology and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, some of these churches are, you know, the Mormon church is estimated to be a $250 billion organization at this point. And we've been able to show, and others have shown, that it spends less than 1% a year of its revenue or profit uh, doing charitable or altruistic causes. Check out Inside and Peak and the whistleblower, David Nielsen. Uh, the only things that we know the Mormon church has spent its massive investments on in the past, I don't know, five or 10, 20 years have been bailing out uh, City Creek Mall, at giving in an extra billion or two for cost overruns, and bailing out a failed insurance company, Beneficial Life, with, that the church used to own that went under. Other than that, we have it from inside sources of the people that manage the church's money that it just doesn't spend its money on charitable purposes other than these small little piecemeal efforts that appear to be mostly PR campaigns at this point. But you know, it's, it, you're exactly right, but it's always like dirtier than it even appears on the surface. City Creek was not just the church investing $2 billion into a mall. It was predatory and aggressive, um, actions to put the, um, to put, um, gateway out of business. Like, 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 like that, that there, there was the, and, and you can talk to for, have you ever had, um, Rocky Anderson on? I, I, I'm uh, no, sure. I've met him and you know what? He's running. I think he's running for mayor again. Did you know? He that? knows where all the bodies are buried. Um, and, uh, and, um, yeah, you, you should, you should, you should get him. Um, and you know, he, and, and, and Didi Corradini can tell you some stories too. The, 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 the church is the, the church plays dirty. Um, and you just, you just wouldn't believe how dirty they get with their money. It's just, it's just, it, it blows my mind. Yeah. Okay. So follow the money, follow the money. That's what you're saying. John Larson always, yep. always follow the money. All right. Okay. Unfortunately, we still have more of these. Jeez. All right, let's keep going. All right. Members are encouraged or um, required to never say anything negative about the leadership. Yeah. Um, I, I, no, that's, I, I, that's a cousin to the one of it excommunicates critics, right? Yeah. I, I, I heard that one time and this is stuck with me. This is years ago. There's a, there's a quick, um, there is a quick test to see if you're in a cult. You ready? Okay. Listener out there, you, you, you take whoever is the leader of your organization. Now quick, say something negative about them. If you find yourself unable to do that, you're probably in a cult. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's one, one reality in 21st century. Well, in the history of Mormonism, no one ever gets up publicly and criticizes any leader ever. Right. And, and if they do, they're toast period, like full stop. And mm -hmm. every Mormon knows that and just try it sometime. If you don't believe me, try it. And if, and if you, if you think we're lying, I welcome any viewer or listener to record a testimony meeting where they get up and fast in testimony meeting and criticize the prophet, criticize Joseph Smith and criticize their Bishop. And y you show me if you're a member in two months. Yeah. And, and there might be people saying, well, why would any church, um, you know, encourage or allow people to criticize? Well, that's the way organizations run. Like most CEOs are not obsessed that every last employee, you know, um, down to the, the entry, entry level position, never say anything negative. The only ones who do that are, are lunatics like Elon Musk, right? Um, normal organizations know there's always a healthy amount of dissent and that's just the way humans, humans work. And when, and when you get obsessed with that dissent, especially dissent from people who have no power, you're probably a cult. Yeah. Yeah. The, the best opposite example of this that I've been able to think of is Abraham Lincoln with his book by Doris Kearns Goodwin, team of rivals, where he literally brought into his cabinet people who ran against him or who were vocal public critics of him because he knew he would be a better manager if he had people willing to criticize him. He knew the dissent was crucial for, for good, um, governance, right? Yeah. That's yeah. a sign of a healthy organization. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. The organization uses litigation as a means to silence dissent. Um, di to silence dissident members or outside organizations speaking against the group. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, it uses SLAP. What, uh, what's the acronym? A strategic lawsuit against public participation or, or whatever. 
the church has been caught doing this sort of things. Mostly it does, it does, it's dirtier, it uses NDAs. Um, there's been a lot of people who've been molested. I've joked over the years, just half kiddingly, that if you are a woman between the ages of 14 and 30 and you want $30,000, all you have to basically have to do is accuse, you shouldn't do this, but all you have to do is accuse the church and they'll send their lawyers in, Curtin McConkie, they'll write you a big check, oftentimes about $30,000. I have it on good authority. And then you'll sign a big NDA that'll make sure you'll never talk about it again. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's, not, that's, that's not what good, healthy organizations do. Um, you know, your, 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 your local knitting circle doesn't use <laughs> lawsuits and NDA. And, matter of fact, anybody using an NDA uh, starts getting a little dicey. I understand yeah. that sometimes they're required, but they're overused. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and we all know that that one of the most prominent features of the whole City Creek Mall redesign was the erection of of Kurt McConkie's, uh, you know, law offices, which is the church's blessed and set apart and confirmed official law firm, which is probably a hundred million dollar law firm wouldn't you say john larson oh I, they, they they've got their hands in in a, in a lot of stuff yeah and, and and remember we brought this up in a podcast a few months ago they're heavily involved in in um lobbying and um, um writing litigation or writing laws even um um and 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 they're heavily involved in conservative politics i don't want to talk about uh politics today but i just want to point out that the church is heavily involved in conservative politics yeah. Yep. So, and, and Christ was, if he was condemnatory of anyone, it was sort of the scribes and the Pharisees and mm -hmm. what we would call the lawyers. So again, on the spec, we, everybody, when, you, you know, there's this famous saying, you know, we love Mark Pugsley. There's this famous saying, everybody hates lawyers until you need one. I respect good attorneys, but the more cozy an organization is, with armies and armies and armies of lawyers, and most importantly, to do deeds of cover up, to cover up misdeeds, or to lie or cheat or steal, like in the case of the Securities and Exchange uh, Commission kind of uh, denunciation of Ensign Peak in the church's financial practices, that's a sign of an unhealthy organization. All right, John, what's next? Mm -hmm. Um. Um. Yeah, I was going to go more. Uh, uh, no, this, you can, you can. Go no, ahead. no, I was, was going to talk about um, litigation and um, slander laws and why I'm not afraid of the church, but that's that's irrelevant. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, community leaders are chosen by the central organization. Local communities have no say in who their representatives will be. Mm. Um, we had talked about stake presidents um, earlier, talking about, um, you know, the – the what what if they're wrong what's your what's your recourse if if they're abusing their power um i happen to know how stake presidents used to be picked i assume the church still does it the same but i'm not part of the church anymore so what would happen is about on either thursday or friday a member of the 70 would come to a stake when there is um going to be a new stake president this individual most likely has never been in the stake knows nobody in the stake and is just parachuting in from Salt Lake City. They will begin to then interview down a set list that's given them by the church. And that list includes everybody in the stake presidency, including like the stake clerk. It includes all members of the high council. It includes all of the bishops. And um, and there's a couple others they throw in. The, the, um, the area authority has at his discretion, and, and remind you, these are always he's, everybody we're talking about are he's here. Women are completely boxed out of this process. Um, the, that um, at discretion to interview other people. This individual is supposed to pray and then wait for inspiration to pick who the leader is. So, and then by Sunday, there will be a conference in which, and it's usually Sunday evening, in which like, like the, like the contestants on some weird um, reality TV show, they announce who the new stake president is, and then the stake president has a short, and then move from there. That's lunacy because there is no God telling these guys who to pick. 
it's it's not only are stake presidents imbued with a lot of power, they're not picked by any sort of real mechanism. Well, okay, so I'll p push back on myself, John. Well, then how? why do we see so many characteristics that are common in a stake president? I'll tell you what I've seen over and over again in my life, and I've talked to a lot of people who've seen the same, is a stake president almost always, um, I would say with 80% frequency, comes from the most expensive um, the, the, the highest, um, valued neighborhoods that the stake covers. Um, and they will, the stake president will usually be really well connected. Um, cause they'll not only, they'll ask like the high council who they recommend being the stake president. So they'll look for, for the people who are already in that circle. And, and, you know, a, a stake can be, if, if you've got 10 or 12 wards, of 300 to 500 people each back in the heyday, you're talking about 3,000 3, men. Um, then there, there's, there's no way for anybody to know all of them. Um, so, so you're, 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 you're doing this thing to these people and, and it, it's completely controlled by a central organization who knows nothing about your local, your local, um, your local going on, your local needs, et cetera. Yeah. Now, I, I have heard, if we want to try and give the church a little bit of credit, I have heard that one of the things they do is they keep a list of people who have stolen money or who have been involved in, in apostasy and or some sort of sexual indiscretion. And they, they sometimes will vet names against some centralized list that they have. Um, but I also think there's a lot of nepotism that goes on where, you know, nephews or sons-in-law of, of church leaders will often be um, designated from on high as, as the, the next people to lead the, the wards or stakes. I also think there are oftentimes interests that the church has in terms of punishing uh, dissenters, um, silencing people. In my case, literally my stake president that refused to excommunicate me was, uh, as I understand it, terminated early and then another stake president was put in who would uh, excommunicate me. These are some of the reasons I, I suspect why the church uh, controls. But, but most importantly, we know that they pick doctors and lawyers and successful businessmen overall as the top leaders. It's because the church wants bureaucrats who they know are going to obey and follow, follow the instruction from on high. Uh, and uh, they they basically want to curate those leadership positions uh, accordingly. Well, they're running a giant corporation, and the product the corporation is selling is basically whatever they have to tell you to get you to pay tithing. And so they 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 pick corporate people. They pick corporate lawyers and corporate um, um, you know MBAs. And you know if if you, if you go look at the degrees. Of, of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, those who are supposed to be prophet, seers, and revelators, and representative of Jesus' original 12 disciples, they're just chock full of MBAs and, and JDs, and from, from Ivy League, you know, white power schools. I, I don't mean white power, I mean, I mean the, the <laughs> sorry, uh, I, I, I mean that, that the, the, the old guard hierarchy that has been running the United States and giving deference to um, Anglo culture for 300 years. Um, um, that's where these guys come from. So it's 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 n it's not crazy that they, they they act the way they do. That's how they were selected. There's nobody in there with a degree in theology. There's 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 you know it, it's it's they, they they get what they're they're fishing for, and no one should be surprised. And what's super rare. Well, women are never called, but what's super rare, of course, it would be a school teacher, would be a plumber, would be a carpenter, would be a social worker, uh, a therapist, uh, a psychologist, you know, any sort of mental health professional, uh, you know, any of those, any of those sorts of things. Right. The They're last school teacher that I know of was Boyd K. Packer, and I would also call him the last theologian. So... Um, yeah, uh, there's a, I, um, because we're on the topic, I want to give kind of a public service, um, announcement. Um, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, the federal agency, BCI, um, will do background checks. And I think every state does this. And if you're checking 
on people for your local whatever, your scout troop or your um, clergy or anybody who's going to be around kids. Um, uh, I, I attend a local Unitarian congregation and I volunteer to watch kids and I had to submit myself to a background check, right? Um, the, the state does this at a discounted rate for like nonprofits. So you can get a, a good background check for the kind of things that you you talk about, but John, I think it's I think it's interesting. You, you defend the church and you say, well, they have this back end weird walk around back process where they 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 vet people in their own way that they won't tell anybody. When there is a public vetting, and I know there is in Utah, where they can vet everybody, every scoutmaster, every bishopric, every relief society president, every person in the young men's and young women's, if they wanted to, it's a resource that is available to them, and they choose not to engage it. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, really, really, really quickly. Let's just go ahead and give. We've, we we're really grateful for the uh, for the support we're getting. MJ writes, suicides from those who don't believe in the church or those who leave it are a major issue. These videos save lives. I agree, MJ. I'm told all the time that Mormon Stories podcast and uh, even John Larson's work has been instrumental in saving lives. So thank you. Without a crystal ball, writes. Thanks for your amazing work. Love your channel. Allison Young uh, gave us a super chat and Emily M is sad that her first super chat was missed. We apologize for that, Emily. We try and thank everyone who, who donates to support us. So thanks to everyone who is uh, using the super chat feature to support us. John Larson, let's continue. This is good stuff. All right. The governance structure of the central organization is, is ambiguous, hidden, or unknown. All you have to do is talk to anybody who works at the COB, anybody who works at the church office building, and I don't care how believing they are, they will tell you horror stories about the, the, the organizational control. They'll tell you about projects that went on for a couple of years and then somebody with a red chair came in and diverted it or derailed it. Can anybody really explain what the governance of the church is? That, there's that big 27 story building downtown. I don't, how much of a believer you are, what's going on in that building? Who's calling the shots? Like, like, you know, if you work for a company, you can get an org chart. And, and we know that there's like the 12 up here, but there's really 15 of them. And there's a first presidency, but the 12 has authority, but the first presidency calls all the shots and it's not really clear what the 12 does outside the first presidency. And then there's the 70, but there's multiple quorums of 70s. Then there's the presiding bishop over here. That's just the stuff we know about. The church is full of all sorts of shadowy sort of things. You know, we find about these investment arms or, or the management of this. Does anybody have any idea how the church actually runs? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. And the, and the first best step that any healthy religion or organization would do would be to publish their budget annually, publish their yes. finances annually, because any self-respected budget is going to have line items and you can see how much real estate, how much in administrative overhead costs, how much in investments. You would just be able to see the breakdown, how much in books or communications or transportation uh meals you know just things that every any 501c3 nonprofit has to do including mormon stories of the open stories foundation even just a simple 990 form that a 501c3 has to fill out gives you a good sense of where the money's going and where it's not going but the mormon church does the flip side which again came out in this ensign peak sec ruling where the church was so worried that people would learn how much money it had that it created like 12 or 13 fake shell <coughs> organizations named them ambiguously so that no one would know uh no one would know to identify them with the corporate church and then they picked fake fund managers with indistinguishable non-typical mormon names to to have their names associated as heads of the fake shell organizations and then create the appearance that each of these 13 shell organizations were managing their own allocated funds when in reality the church was managing all the money at central headquarters and was asking these employees to sign their name as the the controllers 
and as the managers of these funds in these fake shell corporations fraudulently, and all of that has been admitted by, by the Securities and Exchange Commission and in effect by the Mormon church. And that's, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg of how much we don't know. Um, when, when has there ever been sort of like a PowerPoint presentation or a general conference talk that's like, these are the different organizations that run the church. These are the apostles that sit on the various committees. These are the names of the managing directors. These are the major uh, aspects of the church that are that that, that are uh, run and operated under these organizations. And these are the basic annual budgets of these organizations. And then here's where we keep all the money and invest it. That that's that information doesn't exist anywhere. Yeah, and and there's organizations. You know, take something like Union Pacific Railroad, the the, the church. And I don't know if they're still a controlling stake. I assume they are. Um, for a lot of years, that that was a church-run company, and and you went on the board of directors, and it was full of apostles, because up up until up until the '90s, that was one of the ways they paid apostles is they would get you would get uh, one of the red chairs, and then you'd be rewarded with all these um paid um board seat members, but there's still companies where um where the church has 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 not necessarily a majority stake but a controlling stake and all of that is very shadowy um you know we know if, if there is an entity that controls 30 percent of the stock in a company you know it's really pushing the rest of the, the stockholders around but who does that in the church and what interests are they are they representing and and why are they doing this you know my point is it's it's all in the shadows yeah yeah and members deserve to know uh, where their money's going, just plain, plain and simple, and how it's being administered, right? Yeah, and we've yeah. we've inadvertently skipped with the the one we just gave was the governing structure of the central organization. The next one I had on the list is is all finances are kept secret. Okay. So obviously we've just we've just been um, belaboring that. In some ways, those two go hand in hand, right? They really do. Yeah. Yeah, because because you you not you don't just list the money, you list where the money's where and how the money's being spent, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay, obedience to the central organization is encouraged over all other values. Right. And again, you can read the New Testament. Um, you can read the, the, the Gospels. Nowhere, uh, like, like um, Jesus never talks about like obedience to like a, an earthly authority. He might talk about obedience to God or God's law, but, but, but we're talking about in unhealthy organizations like the Mormon church, Flat out obedience is always um, emphasized, which brings us to, and this is should be a podcast in of itself, the central paradox of the church. And I've, I've brought this up more than once. The, the church is is a a restoration um, of of the the gospel that fell into apostasy because the previous church taught false things, i.e. the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church crept false teachings into um, the, the teachings which led them into apostasy. But now we're told that if you obey the leaders, even if they're wrong, you are in a state of grace and you're not in apostasy. Which is it? If the, if the church, um, if all you have to do is obey whatever the church says, then the Catholic Church is still not in a state of apostasy. Because I, I, we can prove that there have been hundreds of millions of people, if not billions of people over the last 2,000 years, who have a genuine, honest, sincere belief in the teachings of the Catholic Church. So if all that it takes is obedience, then the church has never fallen into apostasy. But if, if, if obedience is predicated on the teachings actually being true, we have the problem of polygamy and all the rest of the bullshit that Brigham Young and... So you can't have it both ways. You can't have an apostasy and a restoration and also be able to insist that members today have to be obedient. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, w we're taught in, in the Mormon church this this phrase it's like six or eight words obedience is the first law of heaven is it isn't that have you, have you heard that john larson i've heard it obedience is the first law of a cult is is what it should be <laughs> right and and what what also people don't understand is that 
while you look at these Mormon missionaries and you see that, you know, that, 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 that they do their best to convert people to Mormonism all throughout the world. And you just assume that they're there to bring people unto Christ. Anyone who's inside, inside the church knows that the main function of the Mormon church missionary program is to train and uh, nurture the, the Mormon identity, the LDS church identity within the missionary. And it's, it's within the Mormon mission where exact obedience is, is emphasized very, very heavily, story after story after story of, of how exact obedience brings blessings and disobedience brings the wrath of God or a lack of blessings or even sometimes bad things. And uh, yeah, so obedience is, is the first law of Mormonism. And you say, John, it's the first law of? A cult. Okay. Um, but um, I and I think we talked about this last episode. It's not just obedience, but it is going to be obedience to a set of rules that you're never given, and that's a key factor too. That that no one has ever written down all the rules. Even 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 as I was a missionary, I got out there and I um, decided I was going to be strictly obedient. And I, like four months into my mission, I was absolutely exhausted. The rules they didn't even make sense. They were they were impossible to 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 obey like we only were given like p day to do our laundry but we also had to go to zone meetings on p day like if your apartment complex had the, the washer and dryer full of other people's laundry what were you supposed to do they didn't care we had a rule in our mission that you were supposed to detail the engine once a month um i'm, I'm not kidding you with what like they didn't, they didn't, they didn't buy us any like engine soap or brushes. We didn't even have fucking vacuums in our apartments. We were supposed to keep the apartment clean. It had carpet, but did the church actually buy missionaries vacuums? Oh no, sir. So you were just set up to fail from the beginning. And that is one of the key elements of Mormonism and other cults like, like it is you are never going to be able to do what they ask you because you need to be broken. You, sir, are not doing it. You're not doing it hard enough. You're not doing Mormonism right. You're not obeying all the, did you do your genealogy? Did you do your, did you pay a generous fast offering? Is that a generous fast offering? Did you pay a generous fast? What about tithing? Is it gross or net? What, well, did you sell some stuff on eBay? Did you pay tithing? Uh, it's just this endless menagerie of, of nitpicky little bullshitty rules that can never be done. And that's the point. That's a feature, not a bug. Yeah, and, and and of course the the most gripping in the twenty first century are did you have a dirty thought? Did you masturbate? Uh, you know, to even think an impure thought is is akin to actually doing doing the bad thing. And so even if you are able to write in your journal and say your prayers and read the scriptures and do family home evening and go to all your church meetings and serve in the temple and fulfill your callings and 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 have babies and have a successful career and manage your finances and pay your tithing you, you still you're still a loser if you have the bad thoughts you know what i mean right. it's right it's well there's always going to be something that's that's impossible you know yeah um and then that that's that's the point uh, that's what point i'm trying to make yeah okay and this kind of leads into the the next one um, the leadership of the organization is preoccupied with the most intimate details of members lives including finances sex and personal relationships yeah and we've kind of hit on this one that it's a, it's a, but but they are that that you have to juxtapose it with how opaque they are with how little information we have about how the church runs but they want to know everything absolutely everything um and 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 you know cuz you think even the simple question of if a bishop asks which a lot of do are you paying gross or net well, once they, they ask if you're paying gross, then they know exactly what your income is, right? Because And that's why the, what's one of the reasons they want you to pay gross. Church doesn't need an extra $700 from you. They want to know everything about you because that makes it easier to control you. Yeah. Yeah, and again, this, this was made clear to me in Scientology with their practice of auditing where they, they say they're here to help you for, with your mental health. And then they have you disclose some of your most private, intimate secrets. And this is how they get to know you well enough to then be able to shame you or manipulate, manipulate you or make you feel not good enough or heaven forbid, extort you and punish you if you ever uh, dissent. 
and uh, you know, there's no healthy boundaries um, in, in an unhealthy organization. And in Mormonism, it's just absolutely factual that a 12 year old girl could be asked by a grown adult man behind closed doors, one-on-one, -on -one, whether she touches herself. Fact happens every week in Mormonism across the world. Happens every week. And it's absolutely factual that a Mormon bishop can ask you if you, uh, what underwear you wear. Absolutely factual. And if you don't wear the right underwear and answer that question correctly, you can be prevented from attending your own child's wedding. That's absolutely factual. I'm not making it up. Uh, <laughs> the, the Mormon church can ask you the most, the Mormon church can ask you if you engage in oral sex with your partner. And there are bishops and stake presidents who will punish you and condemn you if they find out you're engaging in oral sex with your partner. Am I making this up, John Larson? No, you are not. I have met more than one woman. We, we usually talk about underwear and we're always thinking about the garment. I have met more than one woman who, when they were a, a, a young woman, we're talking, you know, under the age of 16, the bishop asked them what type of panties they wear. There is no check and balance on this. And there are a lot of weird dudes in those seat getting their rocks off talking to talking to people about things that they 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 really have no interest in talking to yeah and my teenage children some of my teenage children were literally asked by a 35 40 year old man whether they masturbated i'm talking about a 16 17 18 year old young woman the bishop pulling them into their office alone and saying do you masturbate um it, not making this up it happens all the time i'll i'll tell you from my own past when i was 11 so I wasn't even 12 yet. They had a special meeting with with the boys in the ward. And um, they brought in this guy I'd never seen before. And they gave this talk, but it was all completely in euphemism. As an 11-year-old, I did not know what they were talking about. I mean, if they had said, like, jerking off or something, I would have known. I, I knew what that was. But they didn't. And I, I remember the the um, the speaker was talking about the production speed of factories. I am not making this up. And if you're if you're taking a lot of things off the conveyor belt, the the factory is going to gear up its production and produce more more widgets. And he was but talking if, about sperm and nocturnal emissions. I would and, assume you know, that now, yeah. but that, that's not. And I just remember having this sense of dread and panic for the whole meeting and carrying that with me for weeks, months, or years later, because I didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. Um, and, and so I could very well be violating any of those things at that time. And I knew that, that, that when I looked at, at, at girls or whatever, I had funny feelings, um, that, that were kind of tickly, but I was, I was told that that was a sign of wickedness, right? But the fact that they never actually defined what they were talking about was part of the control because then you're always assuming you're doing something wrong, especially if you say, you know, you know, you know what, if you, if you think um, any kind of sexual thought, the, the only people who can go without thinking sexual thoughts are basically asexual people. So, so it's just this weird, um, a broken thing. It, all, all this is gross. I have to wash after we do these things, John. Yeah. And, and we have to, we have to also mention teenagers who make out in the Mormon church and, or engage in any sexual behavior, bishops all across Mormonism feel like they're allowed to say, well, oh, wait, you aroused your passions. Did he touch you over the clothes? And this is a young woman, a young man. <clears throat> did he touch you over the clothes? Did he touch you under the clothes? Did you get an erection? Did you not get an erection? Did you orgasm? Did she orgasm? Did he orgasm? W was there oral sex involved? Uh, what type? How far did it go? W w were clothes off? It is absolutely happening every week in Mormonism where bishops uh, feel comfortable and feel empowered to ask teenagers and young adults and even grown grown ass adults explicit questions about their sexual behavior. And then another example would be 
a, you know, let's just say a widow, a, 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 a divorced mom or a, a, or a man who lost his wife, who then starts dating as, a, as an adult, divorced or single, gets involved in some sort of sexual behavior. They get thrown before a, a bishop or a stake president. They get threatened with a disciplinary council. And oftentimes a disciplinary council is held where in the disciplinary council, you're sitting in front of three or five or 15 or 18 men, whether you're a woman or a man, and they get to ask you these questions about, did you orgasm when he touched you and, and did it feel good? Right. They will even ask, did you enjoy it? And I'm, again, I'm not making any of this up. Oh, it's, it's, it's gross. And it's, it's disgusting. I, it's, yeah. Listen, all you out there, I feel like we need a little bit of palate cleaner. Masturbation is good and happy. And if there's a God, that's the one proof that God loves us, right? <laughs> go flick your bean. Go uh, polish your pole. Enjoy it. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's God's gift to you. All right. Uh, yeah. Okay, your, we're down to the final four. Polish your pole. Polish your pole. <laughs> John Larson said it here. <laughs> all right um the final four leadership tends to speak of the victimhood of the organization even endeavors where the organization has a majority or controlling influence this uh this is one of the the myriad reasons i left utah but the fact you have a full-on super majority of people in control of every aspect of the government walking around at the same time thinking that they're somehow the victims of this tiny minority that is a hallmark of these organizations. The, the The Mormon Church holds disproportionate number of seats, given its population in the United States. It holds disproportionate power, um, both on a federal and local level. It it controls and influences virtually everything. You won't find sports played on Sundays. You know they they just they just get their hands in everything. And, and win all the time, meanwhile, telling them themselves they're the victims of everybody else. Yeah, and you'll get this with the, with the uh, free, religious freedom uh, kind of argument that, that the church is now, now that the church is being held to account for its discrimination, specifically around its, its ability to discriminate against uh, LGBTQ individuals, the church hides behind this, this uh, mantra of religious freedom. And what they're really asking for is is the right to continue discriminating uh, on on the grounds of things like uh, sexual orientation or gender identity, but they do it in this sort of pathetic posture of being discriminated against uh, as as the poor victims who have two hundred fifty billion dollars. A recent you know Republican Party nominee for president and multiple senators and, and members of the House of Representatives and governors yeah, and mayors yep. uh, and bureaucrats all throughout, not just the government, but corporate America, et cetera. This has been, this has been um, I, I need to do a podcast about it. This has been um, a rhetorical element of Oaks since he left the Supreme Court, where he, he constantly frames out that if you criticize, you don't even have to do anything. If you just criticize the church for discriminating against other people, you are somehow encroaching on his religious freedom. That for them, religious freedom for the United States, for the for the Mormon Church, is the ability to discriminate and do whatever they want with no objection from anybody because they frame that as being victims. It's just it's just the most pathetic thing I think about these type of organizations. Um, and any organization, be it political or whatever, that is constantly screaming about victimhood, it's it's just just stop. You're 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 not. Listen, we're all victimized to some degree in this world because human beings are assholes. But you're not special. You don't get a special dispensation. You know when 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 they screwed up Prop Eight, which by the way, read your recent history. The reason gay marriage is legal in the United States is because of the fucking Mormon Church. But when 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 they screwed that up and got caught doing things that they they lied and said they weren't doing, they played the hugest victim card ever. Oh, well, you guys even pointing out that we're operating illegally. That's because you don't like us for religion. Boo fucking who. Stop playing the victim. All right. All right. That's Final true. three. 
The oh, organizational history is overly senti- sentimentalized and unflattering information is edited out of official documents. This is so common with the Mormon church. It's even like, yeah, duh. But um, we're talking about unhealthy organizations. When they have a preoccupation with their history and they're constantly sanitizing it and rewriting it and rewriting it again and reshuffling it and they have to have new manuals and new this and new that, um, that's, that's just a sign you're not in, in something that's, that's, that's worthwhile or healthy. Yeah, healthy organizations are honest with their past and honest with their history. They are, yeah. and and you can you can model it. I remember when I, um, uh, uh, my my ex wife and I, you know, we got tired of of the church stuff, and we moved to North Carolina for a while, um, and that's where the podcast started, by the way. But you'd you'd go to the museums, and they would full on embrace the history of slavery. It was it was very unseemly and a, and a black mark on North Carolina's history. But it was openly spoken of. It was openly addressed. They had artifacts of it. They didn't try to cover it up. And to me, that was such a refreshing thing to actually deal with with their own history and not just pretend it didn't happen, just make these things go away. Yeah. Yep. That's refreshing. Okay. And honestly, the church is trying to do that a little bit more these days, but it's shrouded in propaganda and apologetics. And it's been done at the gunpoint of Google and the internet. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree yeah. with that. They, they are doing more, but not not voluntarily, right? Um, you know, and 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 not with full disclosure. Not and still not with full disclosure, and yeah. still with a lot of spin on it. Yeah. You know, and and they're still blacking out names of people who've been dead for 170 years. Why? Who are we trying to protect now? Well, we're trying to protect them. The we're trying to protect the church. Yeah. Okay, the final two. The organization insists that it has primacy or is more important than every other organization in the world. Mm, yeah. Um, and and you say, well, well, duh, but not not duh. Like that, we live in a pluralistic society of many different people who have many different views about cert- certain things, and to walk around and insist that that. Um, Nielsen or whoever is the president today is receiving revelation for everybody, all 8 billion of us, no matter what their upbringing, what their cultural values are, what, what their, what their costumes, what their language, what, what anything. It's just this weird, bizarre belief that God chooses to isolate a small group of white people in the inner mountain West and then do all of his dealings right there in a way that is not going to break through. Let's face it, if the 8 billion people on this planet, I would say easily 700, 7 billion, 500 million have never heard of the Mormon church. The vast majority have no idea that this even even is there. And the, the idea that they can walk around thinking that, that, that the creator and great God of the universe is telling them you know, whether or not they should visit Sister Monson, it's just crazy. It's just lunacy. Uh, John Larson, I'm going to jokingly call you out. You just mispronounced the prophet of the Mormon church's name. And what I want to ask you is, how does it feel to get so far away from day-to-day Mormonism that you actually don't know the name of the church's prophet? <laughs> it feels fan-fucking-tastic. It's about feels. I could, there was a time, John, in the height of Mormon expression, where I could rattle off the names of everybody who'd ever been in the Quorum of the Twelve. I probably don't know. I, I don't know um, a majority of them. Yeah. I think you called him Nielsen. <laughs> yeah. What, what's his name? Uh, Russell, Grant M. Nielsen. Russell M. Nelson. Yeah. Russ, Nils, Russell M. Nelson. You got to get that M in there. That's that's the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. See, listen, dear listener, there is hope. Even somebody who's wonkily studied the church as much as me doesn't give a shit. So someday you're just not going to care. <laughs> Don't you love oh. it when people say, John, I'm so sorry I don't listen to your podcast anymore, as if we're, like, mad when they move no, on? No, I love it. it <laughs> it's, you should, you should, uh, we're like methadone. <laughs> it's fantastic, but you only take it for a little while to get off the heroin. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> All right. Uh, and the last one. Um, the group has an almost obsessive focus on the outward appearance of the organizational buildings and properties. Grass is meticulously cut. No litter is ever found. Grounds are always perfect. A great deal of time and effort is spent on this resource. 
And and you know we, my 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 partner Kimmy and I, we were driving by the the steak center in, local here in town, and you just see just how meticulous the the yard is, and and it's like, well, who even does that? You know, like do any of the do any of the members know who is keeping that thing up? You know, and and you, and you look and say, wow, that, it, that that that's got hundreds of thousands of dollars of landscaping. And, you know, all these temples that are lit up just like crazy, like uh, Washington, D.C. is an example. Um, San Diego is an example. Like San Diego, the fucking temples in La Jolla, some of the most expensive property in the whole United States. And it's there with these great big, huge floodlights that are on all the time. And just this obsession of appearance. And the only other organization I can think of that is as obsessed with their appearance um, in the same way the church is, is again, North Korea. Um, you know, when you see the official palaces, I've read that they have people with scissors who go and cut the grass when they have diplomats and people come in. Um, and, and, you know, you go to Temple Square and it's just a ridiculous obsession with, with material things. I think there's a whole section in Isaiah about this being the sign of, of the apostasy church. But but no no it's always it's the top it's it's teak and mahogany and rare Corinthian marble and every other finery that they can get their hands on. Yeah, and what that speaks to is just the primacy of appearance that you know you you don't show you, the the wizard it's Wizard of Oz right mm -hmm. you you go to Oz it's majestic you go in to visit the Great Oz and there's this huge projection of the super powerful mystical leader. What they don't want you to see is what's behind the curtain, right. and so there's a there's a heavy emphasis on appearance. There's also a heavy emphasis on um, on never showing any flaws because if there are flaws, that means it couldn't be led by God. If you're going to claim that God is at the head of what you're doing, you can't show imperfection, and of course that leads to toxic um, perfectionism uh and to fraud and to deception and to the hiding of abuse um and and all sorts of terrible things um but, you know but it, but it looks good and that's that's the you know that's the rub and and organizations will spend a whole lot of money to make things look good but but what really counts is what's going on behind the scenes and i think maybe what's most poignant here is christ's admonition something about whited sepulchers how mm. you know how how there are organizations or people who look white and pure on the outside but i think what christ was most concerned about is the the corruption and the corrosion uh within and you need whistleblowers and accountability and transparency to to be able to see that that corruption and um and an organization that's unhealthy is going to do everything it can to never let you see behind the curtain right right which is why i you know i brought up um you know when it comes to water conservation in the west the church is still struggling frantically with this because they they have invested so much of their own sense of self and sense of worth both as an organization and individually as members in like these these heavily fertilized heavily manicured very select um, um, cultivars of grass, you know, like like, and 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 in, in in ways that use way too much water and are not healthy for the local environment. They're not healthy for bees or other other things, and they're they're putting fertilizers on that are in, that are coming into short supply, but they just can't stop. They just can't stop. Um, and and. It's, it's because they're so obsessed, like you're saying, about this outward appearance and this belief. And I remember being part of it, this belief when a temple opens up, the people are just going to say, what a gorgeous building. People are going to want to join our church. And if, if, if that were true, we'd all be Catholic, you know, or, or, or we'd all be um, Hindu. Uh, actually, it makes prettier buildings than the um, Middle Ages. I think, and yeah. anyway, um, it's 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 just an an outward sign of of nothing. It doesn't mean anything, you know. If if you got a well manicured lawn, you know this from your own neighborhood. The people with the most beautiful yard are probably the people with the most resources, not the kindest or the most friendly or the people you really want to say. I want to find out what that guy believes about the nature of the universe. 
I mean, the wealthiest, wealthiest, wealthiest among us who can afford the most pristine buildings and and grounds are probably the ones who have who have been engaged in some sort of exploitation, right? Because how do you get fabulously wealthy? How do you become an organization that's worth a quarter of a trillion dollars? It's not just from doing good. And it's not just from like helping the people that are a part of your organization. It's through some sort of imperialism, colonialization, and or exploitation. And it often comes through deception um, and through an unhealthy wielding of power and influence that allows you to exploit the resources of of your members right mm -hmm. and that's really what this whole list of yours john larson comes down to it's undue influence it's having too much power and the the ability to amass power to manipulate and exploit the the people within your organization and then to use the money that you extract from the members who you're exploiting to enrich yourself in very corporate commercial ways. And um, I don't have anything against, you know, I, I think that capitalism, it can be corrupt. I think any sort of economic system can have problems. Uh, I'm not against all forms of capitalism per se, but I am against um, coercion, unhealthy influence and exploitation um, through, especially through coercion or deception. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, uh, there's been many wonderful things that have happened in this world due to capitalism. There have been many wonderful things due to every ism. Like, like things can be abused, and I think that 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 kind of belabors your your point. Is there there that these all point to signs of of the way they treat the, the the members as opposed to being an intrinsic evil in and of themselves. The fact that they're obsessed with grass doesn't mean grass is evil. The fact that they're obsessed with money doesn't mean that money is illegal. But as Jesus ta taught us, render under Caesar what is Caesar, you know, and and you have your reward if that if that's what you go after. So so it's it's the dark heart that resides underneath these underneath these covers, and it shows why we have to be careful and look at the whole the whole bag because you can wander into church and have lots of good, lovely, friendly people trying to build a community the best they can, trying to be generous um, parts of the community. Mormons are generally good people, or they're at least as good as everybody else. Um, um, and and that means that there's a certain amount of, amount of them, about one in 20 teams seems to be the number that are rotten. And But, you know, the like I explained in the previous podcast, the, the people who are rotten systematically get ri raised up to the top. And, and then you have an organization that knows how to get money and keep money and lawyer money up, but it doesn't really know how to give it away. It's lost sight completely of the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. And I'm not a Christian, but I'm a fan. And I sure would love to see more people who profess such a love for this man who they think is God to follow what he said. Yeah, it reminds me of that famous Gandhi quote. Uh, you know, I've got no problem with Christianity. It's the Christians that I struggle with, um, and and, but, and I and I have a lot of really good Christian friends. So this isn't a condemnation of me Christians. Too. Yeah, agreed. Um, but but I do think one of the greatest ironies, and this is maybe how I would close my thoughts today, John Larson. One of the greatest ironies of the modern Mormon Church is that it's 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 become the fulfillment of Jesus Christ and ironically the Book of Mormon's prophecies of what a corrupt church in apostasy ends up looking like. What does it look like? Check out Lehi's dream. It's a great and spacious building with people who are prideful, wearing costly apparel, who are pointing their fingers and mocking everybody else who are in the mists of darkness. <laughs> Christ himself said that it's more difficult for a, a, a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to enter the eye of a needle. Basically what it's saying is it's hard to be good and to be super wealthy and powerful. And that's what the church has become. And then Christ condemns the people who have massive wealth, but who hoard it. 
And if there's any organization I'm aware of that is most guilty of hoarding their wealth, it's the Mormon church because it has larger cash and stock and bond and real estate reserves than like the top five Ivy League endowments put together. And yet there's no evidence that it's using any significant percentage of its massive wealth to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to give shelter to the to the poor and the homeless. It's literally investing in Coca-Cola, in Starbucks, in Tesla, in GameStop. Pick your corporate stock and the Mormon church is buying it along with two to 4% of the publicly available real estate in every state in the union. It's this massive wealth corporate empire of power and money while it's 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 become a mockery of what what Jesus claimed uh, a Christian uh, organization should sort of be and represent. Hey, it's Lavore. Hey, Lavore, how the hell are you? Who's Lavore? Uh, he's a longtime fan of of uh, of, of uh, Mormon expression. He used to send me um, he used to send me uh, donations with a tithing slip. Good to see you. <laughs> Hey, Lavor, thanks for the super chat. And thanks to everyone who has been donating uh, to to the podcast. John, any any final thoughts? I, I, I agree with I agree with what you're saying. Um, and the only thing I'd add is if you take all the teachings about the church on apostasy or every criticism they have of other religions, they have become exactly what they hate. And and you're exactly right. I mean, no judgment on capitalism but if you take a sum of money and you give it to gamestop the whole system is that we're going to give you this money that you can use and then you're going to pay us back that plus more in that whatever way you're going to do it like you cannot serve god and mammon yeah <laughs> that 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 you cannot serve god and money that can jesus get any more clear than that and and as you're pointing out um, we're not making a statement on the markets, but if the church uses the markets, that's who their God is. That's who they're serving. And every everything they've ever said about the Catholic Church, about, about um, non-Christians, they have become every single criticism they've ever made. It's, it's, it's really lunacy. Yeah. All right. All, all right. Well, we, we did have one question. Somebody asked that they thought within the Widow's Might report that the church um, didn't invest in places like Coca-Cola and Starbucks and Pepsi. And I don't remember the total details. What I do remember is that according to the Widow's Might report, when the church felt like it was successfully able to hide its investments, it was investing in uh, what, 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 is, what are known as sin stocks. It was investing in things like gambling, um, in in caffeinated beverages, which is a Mormon sin, in in things like hotel chains that that sponsor uh, adult entertainment. Um, you know, go to the Widow's Might report if you want to see details on the sin stocks uh, that the Mormon Church has a history of supporting. I don't have them all top of mind. But you would be surprised at the things the more not to mention war stocks, stocks that that violate you know Jesus's admonition for peace. You'll find all sorts of um, interesting things that the Mormon Church has invested in over the Even years. Even if they don't, I'll, I'll, I'm going to one up you, John. I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't mean to be a one upper. I yeah. have known one of these sellers. What I'm about to tell you, I know from firsthand account. The church gets given, um. A, a, a grundle of stock every single day. They yeah. have people in the church. I don't know if they're in a church office building or they're in India or whatever they are. But what they do is they just sell, 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 sell. As far as I know, the church does not prohibit you giving them any stock from any company. But here's where it's pernicious. Okay, I, I'm going to explain to you how rich people launder their money and their taxes a little bit. So you buy a stock... At, at 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 ten dollars, right? And this stock has um has inflated value. Even though you spent ten dollars, you did nothing to inflate the stock. 
So you go ahead and give that stock that you spent $10 on, $10 of your money, to the church. The church just got a donation for $40, which they will convert to cash. And they will do that rather than have you convert it to cash so you don't have to pay taxes. So now you didn't pay taxes on the $30 and you don't have to pay tithing on that. You're taking stock and you're giving it to the church so they can flip it. And you're actually paying less tithing because you're, you're using the markets to take a dip and give them something that's of higher value to them, even though you actually didn't pay it. So if tithing is all about the sacrifice and not the, not the actual getting wealth by the end of the church, the church would disallow this activity completely. They would say, no, you need to pay an honest tax on that money, convert it to tithing, convert it to your income, and then pay on your gross income, pay on your increase. But no, they allow members to work that loophole. So even if the church doesn't hold any of the stock, they're using it as a game to allow wealthy people to actually pay less in tithing. Mm. Okay, that's good. That's good, John. Thank you. I'm going to just add, I pulled up the Widow's Might report. And uh, I'll, I'll share, I'll share the link. It's their discussion of what's called sin stocks, and what they show is that before uh, a lot of their shenanigans got leaked, they were investing. This is prior, I guess, to 2019. They were investing in things that either you would consider a sin stock or that they would consider a sin stock. So, like Netflix. Now they, they consider Netflix to be something that they won't invest in because I guess it has dirty movies that show naked bodies. But but prior to 2019, they invested in things like Netflix, Urban Outfitters, Take-Two Interactive, I don't know what that is, VT Properties, I think that's gambling, um, Amber Combrey and Finch, which I think is sexy advertising. But there you have it, Dr. Pepper, um, uh, Philip Morris, and Laureland Tobacco. So these were investments of, of the Mormon church prior to 2019, where the church got caught with its hand in the cookie jar uh, before um, before they knew that people were, were watching. So anyway, not to neutralize the good point you were making, but... No, no, go. it's, it's, good. it's good information. Yeah, by their fruits you shall know them. I think we've done a good list. Um, I'll send it to Maven and have her put it up um, on the on the um, YouTubes and wherever else we do things. So if you want to read it yourself and, uh, and um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. And thanks to everyone who's Well, John Larson, another amazing episode and a testament to it is that two and a half hours in, we're still at 800 live uh, viewers on the live stream. So I want to thank you, John, for always bringing such informative and uh, passionate commentary and analysis. And I want to thank all the viewers and listeners who either are joining us here on the live stream, but also all those who join us at home. Thanks for all the super chats, your donations, um, make this possible, make John Larson's appearance possible. A shout out to Kara Burrell, Nuance Ho, who couldn't join us. Please like and share this episode today. Please subscribe to us on YouTube or on Facebook. We're also on TikTok, we're on Instagram. Uh, we're, um, wherever we kind of are on Twitter, please subscribe to us wherever you can. Please become a monthly donor. Uh, you can donate directly to the Mormon expression series by going to mormonstories.org slash Mormon expression. That's how you keep John Larson on for weeks, months, and years to come. Uh, uh, please just go there and become a monthly donor. Also, please support Kara Burrell at Nuance Ho on, uh, Patreon and on YouTube, and she's got a donor box link as well. We love Kara, and we wish uh, the best for her. And John Larson, any final words before we go? No. Oh, oh and thank yeah. you to Maven. Thank you to Maven for moderating the chats and for all the post-production work that Maven does behind the scenes, as well as Gerardo and Brooklyn and Julia, who chops up our shorts. Gerardo does our thumbnails and is a strategic advisor to me. Brooklyn does our video editing, and of course, our board of directors, Clint and Carrie. Uh, we couldn't do it without all that support. It's a lot of work, and um, and the, and they're doing the stuff that's thankless, and they, they do a great job, and I, I really appreciate it. No, just remember, hey, if it, if it pisses you off, if you're feeling angry, you're my people. You're okay. They're the they're the ones. They did you dirty, and you and you're good. 
All right, John Larson, do you want to give us a preview for what's next, or do you even know yet, or is it a secret? I, I'm not sure, so I, I got to figure it out. We got some good ones coming up. I got the list. I need to. I need to see, and I. I think I'm. I think I'm a little bit behind. I owe you an extra bonus episode too, so uh, so it'll be some. It'll be something that's enraging me at the time. I'm sure. Well, that's been my my problem for you getting behind. So I'll I'll do my best to fix that. No, it's uh, it's 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 all good, and 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 you know, you guys, this is a labor of love. You have regular lives and all the other stuff going on. You know, I I think sometimes there's undue pressure on people in this space, like they're somehow supposed to be um, saints, which they are. They're good people, and they're supposed to be eschewing money and somehow paying the bills and and all that kind of stuff. But we all have regular lives. So, John, I appreciate how much of your own life and your own person that you sacrifice for the benefit of so many. Thank you, brother. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks to everyone. Thanks to everyone who's been with us today. Thanks for joining us. Please come back uh, next month or sooner for another John Larson episode. Uh, check out Mormon Expression Library on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to 300, I think, ish episodes of Mormon Expression, some of the best stuff you'll ever find in Mormon podcasting. Check that out. Um, and uh, thanks for supporting us today on Mormon Stories. Please be good to each other, be kind to each other, and we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, take care, everybody.